Welcome back to Cultish, everybody. It is the Super Sleuth here flying solo. Where is Jerry? Have you guys seen him? I didn't see him. I was at the <laughs> studio today looking for him. I, you know, I looked under the couch. I looked everywhere. He was he's nowhere. Little. Yeah, <laughs> he's little. He's nowhere to be found. He's out doing things. Maybe like last time, maybe he went out looking for some UFOs. I don't know. But I do have some wonderful guests with us today in the studio. I have AJ. How you doing? Yep. And I have Brandy. Hello. Yeah. And they they have a beautiful story of coming to know the true and living God and coming to know one another as well through that story. So we have them here today and we want we want to get to know them more and we want to hear their story. So we're gonna we're gonna start with AJ. AJ, what where did you come from? <laughs> <laughs> That's the mystery of where life. Where did I come no. from? Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Um, so I was actually born in California and I moved to Arizona when I was, uh, still in first grade, uh, younger, uh, but I was born into the Mormon church. Um, uh, my parents converted when, so my dad started getting involved with the church when he was like 15, 16. Um, and then when him and my mom got married, uh, she joined the church as well. And then, uh, so when I was born, I was born into the church. We were sealed in the Oakland temple. Oh wow! Yep. In Oakland, yeah, man, from the streets. Yeah. So, so your dad was a he was essentially the first generation LDS in your family because you said yeah. you came into it fifteen, sixteen. Yeah. Okay. So uh, he had kind of a rough family life growing up, and uh, I don't really remember exactly how he got involved with the church, but somebody, one of his friends or whatever, invited him. So he used to go to a lot of the outdoor activities and uh, a lot of the youth stuff, and so that kind of is what got him away from kind of the bad upbringing that he originally had and, and, you know, helped, helped him. Um, you know, I, I think as much as we talk about the Mormon church and stuff, I, I do think that, um, there are some good things that, that do come from at least having that kind of right. atmosphere. And, and for my dad, at least, I think that it really helped him, uh, through a hard time in his life to kind of get out of, you know, bad behavior, get away from bad um, influences and, and of course uh, and all that stuff he's the first member of our of our family to go to college and, and those kinds of things so um you know he he did uh achieve a lot but yeah it, it definitely um it was the he was the first one yeah okay so what what are some of the memories you have growing up like you know growing up in an lds family oh what, man <laughs> tell, tell tell us about that kind of bring us into your world you brought me this i did yeah uh, today maybe yeah. we can i'll put it like right here so maybe it'll be in focus this is uh the my baptism activity and memory book so how old are you when you get when you get baptized in so the when LDS you get church? baptized in the moment you're eight okay yeah and uh so yeah, there's not a lot filled out. I don't think I was super... Um, well, you're eight. Yeah, yeah, so... <laughs> it's still very notice, interesting. If you notice, there's like spots to fill in, uh, like the first presidency and right. all the high priests and things uh, and the leadership of the church because uh, they really want you to know that. Um, and uh, what really struck me when I found that was the some of the scriptures they tried to kind of tie in. Uh, I thought that was interesting, but... Um, growing up in the Mormon church was, I would say, probably very different than how kids grow up in the Mormon church today. Hmm, how so? Um, so when I was a kid, we were not we were not allowed to have soda really at all. Like anything with caffeine in it was a, was a no-go. Um, like not even a question. Right. Um, we could have root beer though. And I remember going to Costco and getting like the dad's root beer for like 50 cents. That right. was like my favorite thing ever. <laughs> um, and then, uh, like, we couldn't go swimming on Sundays. Sabbath? Uh, yeah. Also, I think they teach you not to go swimming, from what I've heard anyway. I didn't go on a mission, but uh, from other missionaries that you're not allowed to go swimming as a missionary, like, the whole time. Really? Yeah. Uh, Interesting. From what I was told, it was like, I don't know, like, Satan has dominion over the over the waters or something like that. And there's been, like, stories of missionaries that, like, almost drowned during their mission because of going swimming or whatever. Weird. So it's like this weird, like supernatural yeah, thing I, going on with swimming. That, yeah. That, you that whole thing is really interesting too, because in Islam, like they believe the same thing. Mm. And when I was deployed to Iraq, the Saddam's like palace was actually like in a moat surrounded by water. And they believe that like Allah can't see like in water because 
like it's kind of like the same kind of similarities. Like they would hmm. commit evil like over or within water because Whoa. like all I couldn't see. So like hearing that when I joined the Mormon church, which we'll get into, like yeah. I was like, that's really interesting because wow, of what I learned when I was in Iraq about the Islam faith. Wow. Yeah. That is extremely interesting. That is like blowing my mind a little bit. Yeah, I'm kind of curious if I, I I haven't had a chance to really talk to Dan Tate at all, but I, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm curious if if that's something that he or if they told him that while he was in MTC or any of that stuff. I'm I'm kind of curious. So yeah, wow, yeah, yeah. Th- we'll definitely get you in touch with Dan Tate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'll be really cool to see a conversation happen about that because I'm sure there's lots of similarities that you guys would have growing up, especially being in an L- LDS family. Yeah, and I would say so. the The big difference I think between like my family and other other kids that I knew, um, I was allowed to have some non Mormon friends because uh, my parents were converts, and so the way they looked at things was kind of you know, well, if we were converts, like if we didn't, you know, if we didn't interact with any other non Mormons, then you know, who else would who else would convert to Mormonism? Right, it's like an and outreach opportunity. Kind of, yeah. And so I did grow up having you know the occasional, but. F- for the most part, my main group of friends all came from church. Okay. Um, and that's kind of how I saw it, right? It wasn't like, uh, like as a Christian now, the way that I look at my faith in Jesus and the way that I view um, everything, it's it's not really about going to church or it's not, I, didn't, I don't call it church, right? I call it, you know, being a Christian or, or whatever. But for, for growing up as a Mormon, it was always like, oh yeah, my friends are members of the church. We're part of the church. We're, you know, we're going to go to church. We're one with the fold. Yeah. 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 It's like v- great group think. Almost like of. checking off boxes almost. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so there was those things. I mean, I was a boy scout. Um, so I did that, that whole thing. And that was an interesting, some interesting experiences. The people that they led around children, mm. uh, Let's see what else. I mean, I don't know. There's a lot of weird stuff that I can. So, so how do you think it differs from the the LDS person now? Like you were saying earlier, that it... well, I, I think for sure the one thing would be like the caffeine stuff, right? Okay. Um, I, I think there's that. I, I think that most likely. Oh, here's the other thing too. When I was growing up, they were very, very uh, adamant about making sure that we knew that. Mormons were not like other Christians. Oh, okay. They made it very clear that we are different. We're separate. We are Mormons. We're not Christians. We're Mormons, right? And they don't have the truth. We have the truth. You know what I mean? It's a very us versus them kind of thing. Yeah. And now it's kind of this weird blend of where, you know, uh, we, we've even encountered Christians who thought that Mormons were Christians. And I, Brandy even had an experience where she got yelled at by a girl at over a Christian it. church. Yeah. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. So, so I think that's I, one of the bigger things. And even actually my, um, my nieces or my niece told my son that they were Christian. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's and he was like, what do I say? I'm like, ah, man, like. Ask him if you could call yourself a Mormon. Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what said. <laughs> right. No, but yeah. it's, you that's know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, at this point, I think we just want him to be able to have a relationship with his, oh, with of his course. cousin. So it's like, uh, I don't, we don't want to get you to like be too, you know, because he'll, he's, he'll he's just. He's cage stage 100% Oh yeah, all he'll the be time. like, you guys are wrong. You guys aren't doing the right thing. You're going to hell. Like he'll, he'll. Your yeah. son? Oh yeah, man. He's, How old is he? He's nine. He's nine. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> He's got that nine-year-old spunk to him, oh, too. Oh, yeah. He'll just, he just says things. Yeah. Yeah. So. Wow. Yeah. I've, I've noticed that we do a lot of outreach to the uh, the LDS wards in the community. So you'll find different generations of LDS. And mm-hmm. I do find it very odd when they, they bring up the, well, your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. Uh, we believe this about Christ. You can even go through the deity of Christ and how the deity of Christ in the LDS organization differs than that of biblical Christianity. And at the same time, they go, well, your truth is your truth. Mine is mine. They as won't. long as you're a good person. Yeah. It's, it's, all, it's okay. It's really, it's really sad because if you think about it, when they bear their testimony, they're already in pure contradiction to the your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth because oh, yeah. they claim that Joseph Smith is a true prophet and that the Book of Mormon is true. Right. Yeah, and that the church is true. Right. Right. Yeah. So, right. So, and because by Joseph Smith becoming the true prophet, he had to say 
all other churches' creeds right, were or, incorrect. That's why God came to him yeah. or sent, you know, sent the vision to him, and, the first vision. And that's what breaks my heart right now about the current state of these people is that there's the spirit behind Mormonism that has caused this cognitive dissonance in these mm-hmm. people. Because we got to remember they're slaves, right? Yeah. They're slaves not only to their sin, but now to an organization that has distorted the true gospel message and has told them something that has literally caused them to not think logically. Right. Like, so when you're baptized at eight years old, literally you're asking a a fundamentally a different uh, Jesus, a different spirit and a different gospel into your life. Here's something else that is I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but something the church has taught for a very, very long time um, is that they don't want you to think for yourself. Um, There is actually documented talks and um, manuals that were written that straight up said like, the the church authorities are there to think for you mm. and you don't need to worry about that stuff. Right. Just do what you're told. That's why there's the church essays. There's mm-hmm. an essay for every answer. Like every question you could have, you can go on, well, not it's not LDS.org anymore. It's come unto Christ. Or, Something yeah. like that, yeah. Yeah, um, and you could go on there and you could type in any question in the search box and the church is going to have an answer for it, which right. is why the CES letter was so controversial that the church had to respond and admit that Joseph Smith was, you know, like married to youth essentially because there wasn't an answer for that. So, so real quickly, Brandy, for the listeners, just in case they're not aware, what, what exactly is the CES letter? Yeah, it's the church education system. Um, uh, The gentleman who wrote the CES letter approached um, someone who said, you know, any questions you have about doubting your faith that you can submit a letter to us with any questions you have and we will answer them. And he wrote a letter, and I think it was 74 questions-ish, yeah, or 74 pages, so more probably less questions. Um, and none of he wrote them several times. Hey, I didn't receive anything back. Haven't received anything back. Um, and it was not only the question, but also like this is the evidence I found for the question that I would like you to respond to. Mm. Um, and for me, that was my shelf breaker, which I'm sure we'll we'll get into. But yeah. it addressed things like plagiarism. Um, basically garments uh, in the footnotes of the CS, CS letter, this guy that wrote it was just fantastic. He, he, um, is my scholarly dream for his presentation. Um, and one of the footnotes, he presented another document that someone had written, uh, to the church, which had, you know, evidence that the garments were originally worn so that Joseph Smith would know who was part of like the original, um, sex cult of the LDS church. Like that's why the garments were originally worn. So they knew who was like basically one with the fold, mm. um, who they knew they could communicate their secrets amongst like their secrets. With. And that's documented, verified in the CES letter. Yeah. So if you go the CES letter, so what we now. did, yeah, it's a book now. Oh wow. So what we yeah, did is we went through the CES letter and then we went through every single footnote, which took us, it took us forever. Um, I think we got about three quarters of the way before we were just broken. Mm. Um, and it, it, and every single thing, it goes back to a factual document, either reference to the church website, which now they've changed the website. Right. So what's archived, what's not. Um, but I'm sure that the, there's people that have archived it for us. Wow. You know? Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, so AJ, we've gotten to your stories when you're about eight years old, growing up a little bit into the LDS organization. Now, now what about you, Brandy? Tell us about you growing up. How, what, what about you? Yeah, so I grew up in Louisiana, Georgia, and Arkansas, so I'm just Southern through and through, third of my life in each of those before I joined the military and moved to California. Um, I grew up um, Second Baptist and Episcopal, which is crazy to think, but I would go stay with my grandmother in the summer, and she was Episcopal, and my family was Second Baptist, so we'd go to the Second Baptist Church. And... um, and not only, I guess we, we kind of went to a Presbyterian church or like just a non-denomin- non-denominational as I was hitting my teenage years. Mm-hmm. Um, that was a cool thing to do as a teenager, right? Go yeah. to a non-denominational church. Yeah. And in Georgia, <laughs> in Georgia, there are you plenty. You get that killer music, in, right? Yeah. In Atlanta, there are plenty. <laughs> right. Um, and so we definitely went to the one that had the Awana or like the sports, the upward sports programs because my parents put us into that. So that was really a draw for us to go to that church. So that's the church we went to. Um we were definitely cultural Christians, and uh, I'm grateful to say that my mom has uh, become more uh, 
like concrete in her faith now. Yeah, definitely um, closer to God as she's gotten older, and I'm so grateful for that. Amen. Um, however, back then, church was something that I was grounded from. It was a privilege. It was not a right. Like it was not um, something that our family was concreted upon. It was something like, well, you can go to church if your room is clean. Oh, wow. So uh, huh. it was definitely, there would be times that I was grounded for six, seven months um, and I wouldn't be, be in church. There would be nothing. Um, wow. That, you think that would be the place where you're, you should be at right now if you're having these troubles at home, yeah. like not honoring your father and mother. You right. should probably be in church. Uh, that should probably <laughs> yeah. help with your spirit so a little definitely, bit. So um, definitely, you know, like when you have your kid, you're like, what's something I can do differently yeah. with my child? Right. And one thing is my, I don't care if my child's sitting there grumpy, he will be at church, you know? Right. And yeah. I love this church. I love Apologia because... Not only do I get to sit there with my child grumpy, every other kid gets to see him and know that he's in trouble. You know, right. so <laughs> he doesn't funny. get to go away to Sunday school and pretend We've that everything's fine. We definitely take him to church grumpy more than once. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, you don't get to go to Sunday school and pretend that everything's great. So. Oh, that's very, very true. So, yeah. Wow. So, so take us. So you grew up in a not like nominal Christianity, yeah. essentially. So, what led you into? Mormonism then? So when I was, um, I turned 18 and like I said, um, didn't have a very good home life. And um, literally on my 18th birthday, I was still in high school. Um, I left my parents' home by I don't, by whoever story you want to take. Um, I left their home and I moved in with uh, someone from high school. And once I graduated, I essentially was homeless. Like my time was done there. Um, i went to Memphis and I stayed in Memphis for a couple of weeks from Atlanta. And at that point, my time was done there. And the only person that I had known, um, cause I was not welcome into any of my family's house cause that would cause family drama, um, was my grandparents neighbors, literally across the street, driveways matched right up. And, um, I called them and I said, Hey, I need a ride. And little rock was like two hours from Memphis. And they came and picked me up. And I moved in with them and I lived across the street from my grandparents for about a month and a half, I would say longer than that. And um, I found out that they were Mormon and that's not something I ever knew. I did not know what Mormonism was. I, right. I knew there was a Mormon church by our high school. And now that I was Mormon, I knew that's for seminary. Right. But I, I can't tell you who in my high school was Mormon. I, I don't even know. There had to be some. I, and I even went back through my yearbook and I was like, who was it? Who You're was trying to look through the pictures. Spot the Mormon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and in Georgia, it's much harder because there's, there's yeah. probably all converts. You know, there's hardly probably any um, actual Utah Mormons that move there for fun. Right. Um, so I didn't know. And to me, it was just another church. So the rule for me to live with them was you take the lessons and you go to church and you can live with us. And to me, I'm like, OK, I'll go to your church. Um, and I was taking the lessons. But back then, this was 2005, um, every single lesson, even after the first lesson, the missionaries were like, are you ready to get baptized? Mm. And I felt this like real drive within me after every lesson I would rebel. I had like this real rebellion in me. Don't tell me what to do. Yeah, it was crazy. I Not that I was like sneaking out or anything, but um, I felt like the like I was not doing good things in my life. Like, and I knew that the daughter was not doing good things in her life. And um, what got me essentially, and I was trying to do right by them. So I didn't want to get baptized. So every time I'd be like, I don't know, this isn't the right thing for me. I got almost done with my lessons and the daughter had um, snuck a boy into her house. And at this time I was trying to do better, trying to do better. And I told, I woke up the father and said, there's a boy in the house. Or I didn't. I called the missionaries because I didn't know what to do. I said, there's a boy in the house. I don't know what to do. Um, and they came over and woke the father up and I was kicked out. <laughs> so because at that time, you know, you're trying to do better. And I and I thought I was doing the right thing because like the missionaries make it seem like, you know, you're supposed to be a good person. This is who the church order is. And um, then again, yet yeah, I was homeless. And so uh, my Nana found out that I was doing lessons. I went over there. I basically knocked on her door and said, I have nowhere to go. And this is what the stipulations are for me to live there, which she didn't know. And I found out that they knew that they were LDS. They were vehemently anti-LDS. My papa was a Freemason, um, 32nd degree until he passed away. And then he 
achieve 33rd. Um, and uh, they let me move in. And from there, I, my life was just in shambles. I mm. dealt with like demonic possession and the house. And it was just really, really bad time for me up until the time I was about 21. I joined the Air Force right after I moved in with them. Wow. Yeah, crazy that is life. a lot of stuff going yeah, on. Yeah, so that's how, that was my introduction to Mormonism. Okay, that was your intro. <laughs> yeah, so welcome intro. to my life. We okay. speed forward like eighteen years. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so AJ, bring us bring us up to up to speed. Then let's go from being young, being eight, up to the, you know, to where you you meet Brandy and think things of that nature. If if we if you want to go to that to that spot or where where you think would be best. I think AJ has a lot that he's not touched on. <laughs> really? <laughs> in that tell time us. period. Okay, There's yeah, a yeah. lot. Okay, yeah. tell, tell so, us. Tell me what, what you think. What got him to actually leave the church? Like what you witnessed. Yeah, well, I mean, okay, so and I've had numerous conversations with my dad about this too. He's no longer a member of the church anymore. Okay. Um, but uh and so we often talk about things that happened growing up and those kinds of things. And and you know, he told me a few times, he's like, you know, as a parent in the Mormon church, you kind of have this uh, feeling that most other adults are trustworthy and are people that you can leave your kids with. And and so he's like, yeah, we kind of just trusted that they were, uh, you know, good Mormons and all that stuff. Um, unfortunately, though, that's not always the case. Yeah. Um, so there were numerous instances that I remember growing up where just things were not right. Um, for example, when I was at scout camp, we had, there was a guy that they had, uh, I don't, I don't even think he was actually like an official scout leader. They just had him come up as like a chaperone or an adult or whatever. Some floater or something. Yeah. But this guy was a member of our ward. Okay. And he choked out a kid. Oh, wow. Yeah. Like with his bare hands and we're all just standing there like, uh, yeah, it was nuts. Here's the worst part though, is the kid that he choked was not even a member of the church. We had two boys, they were twins, great guys. Uh, we went to school with them, but they weren't they weren't church members. That was just the closest scout troop to the, where they lived, yeah. and we all knew them, so. Yeah. Not everyone is a Boy Scouts LDS, but right. a lot yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I and get I you. actually remember uh, one year at scout camp, one of the leaders saying like, you LDS scout camps are all, you know, you Mormon scout camps are the, you know, or scout, scout kids are the worst or whatever. Like, I don't know. If that's just because we were badly behaved or what, um, but uh, I do remember that being told that when I was when I was younger by some rando scout leader. That was kind of weird. That is weird. Yeah. Anyway, um, so that happened, and my dad was actually the scout master at the time, but he wasn't at scout camp, and so I remember him talking about how he had to kind of deal with the fallout of that, and how they pretty much had to like convince this these kids' mom. Hmm to not press charges sue, yeah or yeah press charges or whatever um and he, you know he said it was like a big deal and they were really adamant to like kind of sweep it under the rug and 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 kind of let it so it left marks like he choked them bad oh yeah no it was wow it was significant yeah I mean, any choking is bad but what i mean like <laughs> what i mean is, is like it you know yeah maybe i mean he was their... like yeah oh my god you you yeah. saw that happen mm -hmm. yep wow man yeah and then um there was another i remember there was a sunday school teacher when we were a little bit older who uh, he was just, I don't know how to explain. He was kind of a jerk. And and so we would, you know, being teenagers, would kind of give him a hard time, you know, maybe say stuff or me just Push his disobedience or whatever. Yeah. And I remember he used to go up to my buddy and like, oh, let me fix your tie and kind of do that whole like, eh, you know, and too tight kind of thing. And uh, it was, it happened more than once. It was, it was numerous times actually. And, and both me and my buddy were, were both in karate at the time. And so finally, I think this happened for the last time for him and he kicked him in the groin, like oh. in the middle of church. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, like we literally would, so the way that we would do it, the way that the order of kind of service would go, we'd have sacrament meeting, so the big kind of group, everybody meets together. And then you'd have Sunday, Sunday school and then we'd have priesthood or young women's or whatever. And I don't, mm -hmm. yeah. And so anyway, it was, I remember it happened as we were transitioning from class to priesthood, this happened and he, you know, yeah. So, wow. so when he did the whole tie thing, he wouldn't, it wasn't like a joke. It was kind of like he would hurt people. A little yeah. Bit yeah. No. It. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. And that never really got addressed by, I remember us telling people about it and no one really 
cared or really wanted to deal with it at all. In fact, it got to the point where that same guy, we were older, um, there was a girl that was a little bit younger than me who was upset probably by something he'd said. And she got up to leave his class and he physically grabbed her shoulders and like shoved her back down into her seat. Oh, wow. Yeah. So lots of weird physical altercations are going mm-hmm. on while you're yeah. younger. You're seeing, so what you're seeing as a young, you're like almost like a young adult this time, yeah. like in your teens. Yeah, I was like 14, 15, okay. 16, out, something, yeah, around so, there. So we have a, a, an organization that claims this spiritual holiness, mm-hmm. right? Like this reverency that needs to be happening at all times. Right. But there's like an outward uh, expression or let's like like a mannequinism that they like to portray to people. Like That's a terms, perfect word for it. Yeah, but That's then, but on perfect. the inside, you're seeing like physical abuse starting to happen in areas. And I'm not going to say that this happens at every single ward or anything like that. No, this, this is, is your just, personal experience. Yeah, this These is just stuff I witnessed. That yeah. you've noticed. But one thing we have to understand, especially as listeners here, is that regardless of what people say about themselves, is we know the true spiritual state of man is that they're slaves to sin. And if you don't, if you're not released by the Spirit of God. We shouldn't be surprised by these things, regardless of what people say, mm-hmm. right? So, so walk walk me through that as being a teenager and growing up, trying to have this reverency in terms of the re- the religion that you're in, but then seeing something that's totally opposite, like the fruits, in a sense, are opposite of what's actually being portrayed. So, I think an important thing too is there is a lot of separation. Mm. Um, between like real life and church life. Um, I kind of saw them as different. Hmm. Um, And while being Mormon did kind of encompass a lot of things of my life, um, growing up, it was always like a, like while we're at church, you know, we do kind of one thing and and you kind of put on your best, you know what I mean? And then when you get home, things are kind of different, right? So So it was a dualism. You had a mask or something. Oh, for sure, yeah. And, And so... Uh, so when we'd see those things go on, it was, I never really attributed it at the time to like, oh, this guy's, you know, supposed to be a a high priest or a, or a Melchizedek priesthood holder. And he's supposed to be doing this. I never really looked at it that way. It was always kind of like, this guy's a jerk. This guy shouldn't be acting this way. I think the bigger problem too, was the fact that like when we would bring stuff up and we kind of, my age group kind of had a reputation of being like troublemakers. Um, so much so, in fact, that uh, one of the members of the bishopric's young son at a at a camp trip started a forest fighter forest fire, bleh, and we got blamed for it. Oh wow! Yeah, and Easy this guy was like too, adamant that it was us, you know. Yeah. And uh, once, of course, once it came out who it was, there was no apology given. It was just, well, you guys, you know, whatever. This guy actually, the same person, ended up becoming the bishop. And uh, it was like a flip, a switch got flipped and he all of a sudden, like the youth were like his main ministry. Like he had this special little, what he used to call it, uh, like the Bishop's Bible Club or something where he'd invite like the youth over to his house and they would do like a Bible study thing. Hmm. It was very strange, very strange. Um, so wait, wait, which guy, which guy became the bishop? The guy who started the forest fire? The or? guy whose son started the forest fire. Okay. And he was very adamant that it was my, right. me and a couple people. Gotcha. Granted, okay. we had gotten in trouble a few times at camp trips before uh, for doing stupid things, but we didn't do anything wrong that time. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Not that time. Uh, was this the same guy that like used you for like child labor? So... No, but Mm. that was also kind of a pervasive thing, right? So one of the big things when you're uh, a member of the church is doing service projects, right? So Mm -hmm. uh, when you're a scout, when you're a Boy Scout, you do service projects. And like the church loves that stuff because people are like, oh, I got Eagle Scout project. Great. We can all do, you know, community service or whatever. Right. Um, And you're kind of expected to do those things, right? And of course, we've, I think you guys have touched on this too. Like the, the doing things because you're expected to is not the same thing as like, Doing, doing it because yeah. you have that in your heart because Jesus gives you that that drive to be, uh, you know, help others. Right. Um, but I remember specifically when I was uh, like 16 or so, um, there was a, a few different guys. And actually, yeah, I think we did go to that guy's house. The So he was, so this is before he was a bishop. He was like in the, he was in the bishopric. So like they have like, they usually have one bishop and two counselors. He was like one of the counselors. And um, 
I remember we went to his house and laid rock one time because he was getting ready to sell his house and he wanted to put rock in the backyard so that, you know, it'd be nice for the for him to sell it. Like, does that seem to me, to you, like something that is needed? Like for right. community outreach, mm. <laughs> right? Mm, yeah. But they'd be like, "Hey, bring the youth over. They're gonna do some, you know, some service, active service." Yeah, yeah, laying like, my rock. Yeah, right. So there was so there was weird stuff like that. Another guy um, who was like our teacher or whatever, and he was he was he was very oh man, I'm trying to think of a good word for it. Anyway, he was not nice to us. He was very obvious that he had issues with us. He kind of he kind of came in hard, like this is how it's going to be, and oh, I know you guys, and you know what I mean. Same thing, like we had a reputation, and and you know, no one really gave us a chance to actually like be good people, right? Um, you know, so what so what should have happened real quick is we should have been discipled properly and said, hey, this is how we should be growing, you know, in Christ. This is how. Uh, sanctification works you know mm-hmm. what i mean and instead it was more like you guys are terrible we're gonna make things difficult for you so that you turn your life around you know what i mean right yes. and and so he once again had tried to get all of my age group i think we were priests at the time um that's the title not actual priests right uh so you thought yeah <laughs> at that time or so you did well I, th- I thought i was very holy at the time yeah i could you know bless the sacrament and stuff um so, uh, but he was trying to get people to, I think we were, they wanted us to help us do a, uh, I think he was doing like a stain and a seal on his like driveway. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Just kind of like, I want to do this. Yeah. I need people to help. Come do it for me. Yeah. Send over the bad boys. Yeah. And, and I remember <laughs> hearing my dad yelling at this guy on the phone about how he's abusing the youth. <laughs> <laughs> wow yeah. it's like you're just getting them to do things yeah for i mean you. realistically yeah. yeah like oh hey i need somebody to paint my house let's get the youth over to do it like it's just where does it end you know what i'm saying like wh- where does it where is that like you know are we helping the less fortunate no we're just helping a guy who doesn't want to pay for it yeah you know it's interesting you say that because i've had multiple conversations with many lds missionaries right now and one of the tactics that they're using uh, is doing like yard work for people or that's not new. Yeah. Oh, okay. And yeah, then they actually come to the or... women's house. Like when my husband, would, this is before I was LDS in California, they would come and ask us if, uh, if I needed my laundry folded, it's like they knew he was deployed or Satan told them or God, told, I don't know. <laughs> right. Someone told them that he was deployed and they would come knock on my door and say, do you need laundry folded? Oh, you know, wow. like in exchange for dinner or lesson. Yeah, yeah. You know, and at that time I was like, uh, no, like, why are you at my door? No, you know. Hmm. That's very interesting. Okay. So this is something that's been going on for a long time. Oh yeah. I remember when I was, I, I want to say 16, one of the things that really started getting me to start, uh, like doubting the church, mm-hmm. uh, was they had this whole lesson planned out. Well, first, okay. Let me back up a little bit. When Passion of the Christ came out, mm-hmm. um, and, we were specifically told, do not see that movie. It's terrible. It glorifies the death of Jesus. Like, this is not something that that good Mormon people should be viewing. Right. This is horrible, right? And so that was kind of the the notion I had. In fact, when I met Brandy, she's like, you've never seen Passion of the Christ, the best movie ever, you know? And and not the best movie ever, but like... <laughs> yeah, she was excited. She wanted you to see it. Yeah. Yes. I was yeah. amazed I that he Actually, I still it. haven't seen it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. We, he just watched Legally Blonde for the first time oh, like a couple no. weeks ago. So like... Oh, Public programming as a I'm a Mormon movie is... buff now because I didn't watch movies yeah. growing up. Really, right. we watched we watched like animated Mormon stories. Okay, um, like, like I would be laughing Mormon about movies. like Rocco's Modern Life, and yeah. he's never like, "What's it. that?" And oh, like, never wow. Seen it. Wow. Yeah. I know. He's like, I watched Sesame Street I watched till PBS. I was 16. I'm oh, like, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Like, That's pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it was like my mom was such a stickler to uh, any any anything that was out of so if it's PG 13 and I was not 13. Could not watch it. Ah. You know what I mean? That's the standard, yep. Yeah. But think about now. Like, if that's the LDS rule now, PG-13, like, there's things on Netflix that are PG-13 oh, that yeah. I would never oh, it's watch. terrible, yeah. Never. Yeah, there's mm-hmm. some bad stuff and on so there. And so if that's, like, like Sheologians this week just touched on it, like, to think that your lives as parents and children run parallel, and you are just like, oh, that's their life, like, they're, they're living it, and I'm living mine, but, like, I'll touch in. Like, that's the LDS yeah. family life. Yep. Like on Mondays we meet, on Sundays we meet, but Tuesdays through Saturday, our lives run parallel. And hmm. like their children, they know what to do. They know the rules. 
So if you have an LDS child that's watching something that's PG-13 and they're 14, even 15, and there's things I'm 34 and I would never watch, that is well, well the things are being exposed younger than that. to. We encountered, yeah. we encountered something that was Sorry, rated. I didn't mean to like no, digress. No, no, but no, like, no, 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 no. You made a good point. In yeah. fact, it just reminded me of it's even younger than that. Like we ran yeah, across like P- something like our son watched that was something. like, it was PG, but they were they were talking. I think he, he, yeah, it was, he told us, he said, hey, this show has got like two girls kissing. Mm. And, and it was like, a TVP, like yeah. TVG on Netflix. Yep. Oh, wow. And mm-hmm. and I said, what? And I went and made a post on in the women's group. I'm like, I can't believe this. Like, yeah. But if that, like to think if we were LDS, that's the things my child would be exposed to because that's just the rule. Hmm. That's the standard. Like I would never check in. Wow. Now, granted, mm-hmm. I did grow up watching, you ever heard of feature films for families? You ever heard of that? Uh, it sounds it sounds familiar. Yeah, Did they do like the movies, Buttercream man. Gang yep, movie? Yep. Okay, Buttercream yeah. Gang was my that was my jam. jam yeah, when I grew gang, up, gang. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Buttercream <laughs> Gang. Gang, gang. No, oh man, <laughs> you got the right one, baby. Yeah, that yeah. was like my uh, <laughs> what what what's that movie? It's very popular with uh, Pony Boy. Oh, uh, the, Outsiders? the Outsiders. That was yeah. like my. I don't know if the Buttercream Gang was an LDS movie or not, but I would consider the Buttercream Gang to be like my Christian outsiders. Yeah, no, we we were all like we watched those movies, like we had all of them on VHS. You know, I mean, we watched stuff like Star Wars. You know, but like, but I never as, watched Star. Like the things that he was allowed movies, to watch. Yeah. Like you mm-hmm. watch. What was that scary movie you watched as a teenager with your dad and your sister? Oh man, that was when I was older. It doesn't like I was My never dad, like to think the things yeah. that he was allowed to do, and I was like, "Whoa!" Well, so yeah. here's what crazy. So here's, here's I was the other never thing allowed happened. to watch When I was Star about Wars. sixteen or so, my dad stopped going to church, and he was like, "I'm done. I can't do this anymore." And so, uh, but by my my mom was still very much like, "You guys are going to church." And so we would still go and do whatever we needed to do church wise. You know, I mean, I went through four years of seminary in, in, uh, high school, Mm -hmm. like all that stuff. And, um, so, but my dad would be like, Hey, we're gonna go see a movie. Don't tell your mom. (laughs) And we would go watch like (laughs) underworld. That was like the first uh, fight club was the first radar movie I ever watched. Love that movie. Yeah. Great movie. Um, but not something you'd probably want to show your kids. Right. Right. Um, Yeah. But yeah, and he's like, "Don't tell your mom we're watching this." Or like, we went into the movie theater and saw Underworld, okay. you know. And and then he's like, "We can't." It was like me, my older sister, and my dad. And he's like, "We cannot tell your mom." And we did. We did not tell her. She did not find out for like a year. And then it finally, I think we. Your sister probably told your mom. I think that we night. casually mentioned no. it. <laughs> Maybe I don't know. We casually mentioned it. My mom was so mad. <laughs> yeah. Just because we'd forgotten. Um. But yeah. So like, there was like things where my my dad kind of started getting more lax on just because he was like what's up you know what i mean he probably didn't think it was important or as important especially since we we're getting older but yeah i know you're talking about my dad sat us down and we were gonna watch the movie it oh, uh, i'm okay. sorry not it the shining oh okay so we sat down to watch the shining and it was like my dad's like i'm tired i'm going to bed and so my sister and i are sitting there in the dark <laughs> oh man at night my dad just went to bed and we're like uh let's turn this off we're gonna go <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go to bed too. Um, that's funny. Anyway, that's a little. Well, I mean, like anyway. to to be fair too, like I grew up in like a Christian household, but I mean, I watched RoboCop at the age of five. Oh, that movie's you know, crazy. And in the graphic. first thirty minutes, there's like a hundred, like not hundred, probably twenty five people getting shot up in like uh, a high rise building. You know, isn't there a guy that just like explodes? Yeah, yeah. There's movie? there's a lot of crazy stuff, but but <laughs> yeah. for example, like I like I watched you know The Exorcist probably at like eleven. I've never. Um, yeah, wow. I've seen The Shining. I've seen it. I watched it when I was very young. Young, very terrified of I the movie. I watched it when I was young, but at a neighbor's house. See, when I was going to school, I knew kids who they would come to school with like Friday the Thirteenth shirts and stuff like that, and I never was allowed to watch. That well, stuff well, these. Up. What's funny though is these things absolutely terrified me, and I yeah. probably shouldn't have watched them when I was a kid. <laughs> but I mean, in terms of like the way parent people parent, I'm sure that it's very similar across the board on how involved people want to be in their children's lives, regardless if they're they're LDS or Christian. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, we have standards, though, that are very important in the Bible of how we should actually yes. shepherd our children, whereas I can see it being a very tempting thing to do if I were to be LDS to think, well, you know, these children that are in my life, they're not necessarily my children. They're the spiritual offspring of Elohim and one of his goddess wives. They're actually my brothers and sisters that I'm actually keeping here in this mortal probation. And they now have the free will to do some X and well, not to mention why. we're sealed together yeah, for time their, and all eternity, right? It's right. their own responsibility for right. their own salvation. So it's their choice whether they're eight, five, 1735 
for the choices they're going to make. They know the way. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say, I can, see the yeah. te- I can see the temptation being there, but I'd also see that there's probably many, many LDS parents who are probably like, nope, you're not watching this. You're not doing yeah. that, you know, to try to make it easier for their time in mortal prob- probation, I guess. That was you definitely know? more <laughs> my experience yeah. growing up was a lot of like, now don't, it's don't do this, different. don't do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I think my first purview into kind of starting to doubt the church was I was in elders quorum, uh, and they had brought up how the church was coming out with like a new initiative or something. Basically they, they were like, yeah, you know, we really want you guys to be friends with your neighbors. You know, mm-hmm. like people, you know, like you see your neighbor, like cutting his lawn, go ask him if you want some help or whatever, whatever, you know? And he's like, the whole, like, and I remember them explaining that the whole point of this whole thing was to like basically be kind to them and then they would ask us about the church okay. and then we could friendship evangelism so flirt to convert yeah he hates wait, wait. She so loves when that. i she when i when i joined the church <laughs> that was the term so in you know when it, what 25 so 10 years ago that was the term that they talked about in relief society was flirt to convert that was like the joke the meme then okay. and so when he's telling me about it and i'm like oh yeah flirt to convert he's like don't call it that i'm like well that's what they called it when yeah, i was I in I church wasn't being told to flirt with my neighbors you were just told to, <laughs> well, it's to be friendly and you yeah, know, like yeah. to be yeah, to, to be jovial. To, well, that's right. You that's, know, that's the thing. Too, show them is, the light that's within you. Yeah, bring well, I mean, them in. there's like friendship evangelism even within Christianity, but in in terms of doing that type of friendship, it's almost it's almost um fake. It seems dishonest. Sense. It's dishonest. It's you completely know, completely yeah. different um, yeah. between cross cultural evangelism or cross cultural communication to bring people in and actually learn about them. That's completely different. You know, the way that we're called by Christ to do right. Um, to actually like get into their lives and from the inside out versus it being completely surface, like, okay, great. You're a member now. Bye. Which is what right. happened to me. Yeah. It's and exactly I think genuinely what happened to loving me. and caring about somebody as a person and where they are in salvation and, and trying to share the truth with them because you want them to be saved and and you want them to know Christ I think that's a completely different uh, you're coming at it from a completely different place right yeah and and I remember being told that and just thinking to myself like aren't we supposed to be just being kind to others because Christ would want us to be like mm. it was the first time I'd ever really had like a huge disconnect where like I felt like they were telling me something that was completely the opposite of what the what we were taught about Jesus Interesting. Yeah. And, and, um, sorry, you, you were, okay. No, no, okay. no. I wasn't, I, I know I felt like I interrupted. I, I, no, I wasn't I interrupted sure if you, you. wanted. <laughs> 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 she interrupted the flirt to convert, but yeah. I can, yeah. I can understand there's a very big uh, similarity, uh, to that more is like the, the woman thing or the man thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like really, I, I mean, gosh, I hate to say this, but. I was, you know, when I became a Christian after Mormonism and I was talking to one of my pastor's wives at this point and I said, I'm just really afraid because the Mormon church is releasing their own New Testament. And this was the weight that we had to stand upon was the truth of the New Testament. And now they're releasing their New Testament. And, you know, she said, the only thing we have to stand on is what Christians are supposed to be doing correctly, not the Mormon church. And and I said, wow, you're, you know, and she talked about like how, we're supposed to be evangelizing the way Christ told us to, not to be shallow. We're supposed to be actually living Christ's word, not to be this vapid person that lives by this fake set of rules, essentially, like it's made up like these Pharisees. And right. um, that really got to me. And she said, it doesn't matter what New Testament they have. When you're living the truth and you can actually demonstrate it to them by your life and then showing them in the New Testament, regardless of what there says, then you have the the truth that Christ shares. Like you have that evangelism that they don't have. Mm. And that really, like I went to her crying. Did you hear? Did you hear the LDS church is releasing a new Testament? Um, and that's, you know, that was the hope that she shared with me. And she said, you know, for so long, the Mormon church has been doing it correctly. We, Christians should be the ones knocking on doors. Christians should be the ones folding the pregnant woman's laundry. Christians should be the one taking dinner. Christians should be the one sweet, like raking the leaves. And um, the Mormon church has only been deceiving people because they got that part right. Right. It's everything else that they're not getting right. That's right. I think mm. I think one thing, uh, I feel like I'm jumping around. Sorry. So I was listening to the latest episode with uh, Michael Wilder. Yeah. And a lot of a lot of his experience really like touched me. Because it, it was it felt a lot like my experience, uh, not the mission part, obviously, because I, I left the church before I was 
old enough to go on a mission or I was right about that age. Um, but um, for me, like I had friends that were Christian. I remember specifically going to a couple of different Christian concerts. Uh, like I went to a Supertones concert when okay. I was in high school with uh, some, some kids from band when I was in band. Mm-hmm. And uh, no one shared the gospel with me. Like at all. Yeah. And and so it's really weird thinking about this now. And it's like, you know, would I have listened? I don't know. But um, the fact that, that no Christians in my like vicinity growing up even attempted, I mean, that's huge, right? And it goes back to what Brandy was saying. Like that's stuff we should be doing on a r- daily basis. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, And so, I don't know. I, I try to, we, we're really trying to be more, you know, outspoken about our faith and more uh, evangelistic and loving, of course. We don't want to be <laughs> right. uh, browbeating people, but... You don't want to be a noisy yeah. gong. Right, yeah. exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, and then I think the the other thing, so I left the church like right when I turned 18, like right when I turned 18. And, and the last thing for me really was, uh, I remember watching, so I was huge into church history as a kid, like mm-hmm. really into church history. I had all these audio tapes that were like, uh, dramatizations of, uh, like LDS like, church history. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Reenactment. Oh yeah. Sorry. Not real church. Yeah, history. The LDS, LDS church, church has their own, uh, like movie studio, which is now vid angel. I didn't know. Like, so the same company that makes the chosen. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I really feel like Christians should know that. I don't know if you want to get yeah. that out of here, but, um, <laughs> they are now the company that produces like the temple videos, mm. um, and the videos that he's mm-hmm. taught the reenactments and such. Right. Right. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. So I remember growing up listening to these, uh, audio reenactments of, uh, like Joseph Smith's first vision and pretty much all the way up to, uh, his, his death, uh, at Carthage jail and stuff. And I remember I listened to him over and over and over, like all the time. Cause they were so fascinating to me. Yeah. And, uh, and so I was like, oh man, how great is it that the, you know, the, the LDS church is like got all these stuff archived and documented and like, this is so amazing. And then I watched a documentary on the Meadow mountain massacre mm. on the history channel. I'd never heard about it before. Okay. And I was like, why would the church not tell me about this? This is insane. Like, if if a bunch of Mormon settlers murdered a bunch of people, I would like to know about it. You know what I yeah. mean? And so then things started kind of, you know, the sweater started unraveling for me a little bit. Um, and it was like, all right, I'm done. But unfortunately for me, like, first off, I didn't have anything to really go to. It was right. just like, I'm done with everything. Yep. And uh, it was like... I just, I just was like, okay, well, I'm not going to do organized religion anymore. This is kind of garbage. I'm not listening to this. Or I'm not going to deal with this anymore. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to be a good person, right? That's kind of the whole like, oh, I'm just going to be a good person. And I'm sure God will, God will forgive me, you know. Yeah. Uh, obviously, that's not how it works. Right. And um, the other problem too is that I didn't have like a theological basis for why I left. All of my issues were with the people that I grew up with. Obviously, that was kind of a problem for me. And then also. Uh, Maybe not the people, but just the encounters I had with people that yeah. were part of the church. And then also the, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Uh, there was the people and then the history stuff. So right. those two things together for, for me was enough to be like, this is all a lie. You, you know what I mean? You also said like your dad left you. Like when your dad left the church, he didn't take you with him. No, not really. My mom yeah. still kind of, you know, made us go to church and it was all kind of very much like, well, you guys do your own thing. And, and that kind of attitude, I unfortunately kept. So when Brandy started taking the, the, the church lessons with the missionaries after we got married, um, I kind of was like, well, it's your choice. You, you decide and all, you know, whatever makes you happy. And, and obviously that's not what I should have been doing as a spiritual leader in our home. Right. Um, and that's something I, I regret, but I'm glad that we went through it because, you know, now we're kind of out the other side. Mm-hmm. Um, having, you know, the spirit of, of God with us and, and having faith in Christ and being saved and all that. Um, but so I kind of just lived in the world and, and did my own thing, did whatever, partied in college and all the, you know, stupid stuff you do, um, not really caring about uh, God or anything. I do remember one really significant encounter when I was in college. So uh, I went to NAU for about a year before I joined the military. Okay. And uh, I had been out of the church for a couple of years at this point. 
And um, well, when I say out of the church, I just wasn't going. Mm-hmm. I hadn't left. You didn't revoke your membership or get right. taken off the records. Yeah, or whatever. that happened okay. later. Um, I just wasn't going. So, uh, but I was up at NAU. I'm at my job, and I hear this girl talking about how Mormonism is a cult. And immediately, it was like, it was like I was a church member again. It was weird. I was like, they're not a cult. You know, they believe in Jesus. But like, I was like, oh, wow, you went on the defensive. Oh, yeah. And that, that's happened to me. I have literally been sitting at a football game beside someone who was holding a beer in their hand, talking to me about how their family was LDS. And I said, oh, I used to be LDS. Like, it was so, feels so good to be free of the cult life. And turns to me and just starts, they're not a cult. We believe in Jesus. Like, I'm still a member of the church. Like, girl, look, <laughs> like, <laughs> let's reflect on where we're at right now in life. Right. You know, Hmm. what are you defending? Yeah. It's just like those, uh, it's almost being, you know, growing up in it for people, like going through it for so long. It just, it just like, it's like they're almost trained instantaneously. They They hear that one thing and their brain reverts almost like a muscle memory to defending their testimony. Our son up until, I guess, just this week, uh, the way he starts his prayers, Heavenly Father, like the way, like, cause then the, when you're in the Mormon church, you say right. heavenly father and you, and you like, you it's know, very repetitive. It's very repetitive. The yeah. same. And we just kind of broke it down for him. Like, Hey man, uh, you've been saying the same prayer since you were like four, uh, at night. So you're old enough now. We need to start talking about the things. Yeah, cause like he would, he would add, properly. he would pray yeah. in the Mormon prayer, like the way they teach kids to pray, but still add like, Oh, I'm thankful for this. Please pray for this. Um, please pray for missionaries, blah, blah, you know, but he, he was sincerely meaning it from like a Christian way. But I said, like, let's demonstrate like, and we would show him in the Bible before, like, you know, this is how Jesus prayed. Yeah. Um, and, but just this week, it, it really got to us. It really just like, you know, he, it really clicked with him where he said, oh, wow. And then even last night when he was trying to pray, he was like, heavenly, fa- um, uh, and he said, our Father in heaven. That's how I started. <laughs> he started, his prayer. He yeah, started yeah. like Jesus in the Lord's yeah, prayer. Yeah, yeah. Wait, so, how do I do it? Let's well, let's do it how Jesus taught us to yeah, do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that works, man. Yeah, no, our I've, Father who is in heaven. In heaven. Yeah, yeah, that's how he started. Our Father who is in heaven. Yep. That's yeah. how. You know, and it, but that's <laughs> it's so indoctrinated because right. I mean he was two. Yeah. He had just turned old enough to go to nursery. They don't let them go to nursery till they're a year and a half. Okay. So we had just joined. I remember making a joke like, oh, look, I, I joined at the right time. I didn't have to have my baby in church. But now, I mean, obviously we had another baby. We're back at apology. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we get them through 18 in church. Yeah, um, yeah. Right. That's right. Family integrated. Yeah, it's amazing. Oh, that's great. Though. It's the right way. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, so yeah, yeah. Keep keep going from from there. I want to hear how, okay, so you're you're going to join the military and what's what's tripping me out a little bit is you joined the military. Yeah. So at this point, she joined point, like what two years before me. Okay. Yeah, I joined at nineteen, but I crazy. So I left my nana's house because I was still partying. At this point, I was into drugs. Um, and you know, it, my nana, super Episcopalian, went to theological seminary for the the Episcopal Church, the two year program that they have. My papa, a devout Freemason. Hmm. Um. But there was so much darkness in my life and and like physical, like actual, like physical darkness, tangible darkness. You can cut it with a knife. Yeah. 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 And I remember my Nana saying, that you know, like, if you ever get if you ever feel it like this is something my family is aware of and has been aware of, like since my mom was a teenager, her friend died. Um, they were in a horrible like in a horrible accident. And I mean, this is something like we could have conversations about with my mom. And she would say, like, yes. Um, this person, I don't know, remember the name, but, um, is present at your Nana's house, you know, and like, man, that's scary. Um, so just, you know, read Psalms 21, 22 constantly. So I would have it open at night and just like read it consistently. Well, I left Nana's house, um, cause I couldn't stop partying and was doing like drugs and stuff I shouldn't be doing at that time. And, and what's interesting is I actually, I just remember, I got baptized at 10. Okay. In the, Bap- in the Baptist church. In the um, Southern Baptist church? Yeah. So what's so crazy is like, and I think of all the people I grew up with who did the same. We, and it was at a point of an Awana where you became like this point. Yeah, this I was going to ask if it was little, VBS. This little right. like <laughs> stage in Awana is where everyone goes and gets baptized. Yeah. So you just do it. It's yeah. ritualistic. Mm. Um, Everyone else is doing it. Your friends are doing it. Yeah. Well, yeah. it was like part of you got signed off in your book 
Oh. To like move on to, I don't it know if they still. It was a checklist item? Wow. Mm-hmm. It was like a stamp. Wow. I got the stamp. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah. I didn't know oh, that. Man, so sad. it was like to move on at the, and I'm sure Juana has changed now. It's probably not as evangelistic as it used to be. It's more babysitting now. Um, but it it's so crazy to think that like I was baptized and there's no fruit in my life like ever. Um, but I still thought that I was saved at times when I would try to reach out for Christ and stuff. Um, would still pray. Uh, regularly and try to read the Bible. But like now I know the truth, you know, darkness cannot reside where light is, you right. know, um, Jesus is my protector. Like my, my faith is my truth. And like that Jesus is the truth. He's the only truth. Amen. The um, truth is a person and his name is Jesus. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. That's so, I like got chills. That's so true. Um, <laughs> Jerry said it. I, I took that from Jerry. Oh, wow. That's I'm going to like get that tattoo. That's my next tattoo. That was good. Yeah. Thank you, Jerry. You're yeah. not here, but you're, yeah. you're here. <laughs> Wherever you are. Wherever you are. Um, you guess you put that on a shirt with his face on it. Yeah. <laughs> with Jerry. With G- yeah. Jerry like so, smiling. They'll think his name's Jesus. Oh, that's true. Yeah, like, we shouldn't do that. Never mind. Don't is do real that. His, is Jesus. He has a name as Jesus and <laughs> yeah. it looks like Jerry. What's going on? Yeah. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> All right. right keep going. Keep anyway. So I ended up. I moved out and I had met uh, a guy on like, I don't know, whatever Tinder, probably like Hot or Not or whatever it was. Then. Plenty of fish or Wasn't something. Yeah. Show? yeah. Wasn't Hot or Not a show? <laughs> on MTV or something? Yeah, something so. I don't know. Whatever it was then. Are we, you secretly an MTV celebrity from the early 2000s? Yes. No, I'm just kidding. Um, and I moved in with him and then I went to basic training. I didn't have a driver's license or anything, so I kind of relied on like the very, like, Arkansas life like you just rely on whatever guy will take you to work that day mm. um and uh, that's so cliche I'm sorry from people from Arkansas that's not Arkansas life I'm from West Little Rock not anyway um <laughs> please cut that out no I'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> um I don't want to offend anyone from Arkansas uh so I joined the Air Force and I actually got married to him when I was in basic training, not he was already in the Air Force. Right. And I was already going to join the Air Force. So by chance, I had gotten orders to Japan. But because I um, had gotten married to this gentleman, I ended up stationed back in Arkansas. Mm. And it was a very abusive relationship, which, I mean, is expected when there's two unbelievers together that, you know, trying to pervert God's image of marriage. Right. Um, and trying to live in this, like, weird, like, we're got a good marriage. You can't have a good marriage if God's not in it. Um, and so I remember one night I was just laying in bed and we were about to move to California and I just look up and there's literally the ceiling is like moving in black. Mm. And I'm like, okay, God, um, when you're ready, like I'm done. Like, well, there's like this moment where you don't have the security in your faith to be like, I'm done. Like Lord rebuke Satan. Right. Um, and so you're, you know, like in, you put your foot back under the blanket and you're like, okay, God, uh, like, so, what is this? So you're laying in bed, you wake up in the middle of the night and you look up and mm-hmm. it's like your ceiling is moving. Yeah, and I had black. felt this okay. presence like many times yeah. in the past. Like, you felt so, it at your nana's. Yeah, so when I was actually a young child at my nana's house, I had woken up in the middle of the night and uh, the like the whole house was moving like, and I couldn't walk. Like, so there were like little things that, um, gosh, I mean, it sounds so like Christians get it. Like, that's the thing. Like people who believe in demons and angels, like they get it. But like, it just sounds so insane to like say out loud, which I've never really like said out loud except to my husband. Right. Um, like people like coming out of the wall, like screaming at me, Hmm. like, and like keeping me from getting to my parents' room. Wow. Like physically keeping me from getting to my parents. And that room. was when you were, yeah, when you were younger. Yeah, I was probably like four. Okay. And like the whole, the whole floor is like moving, like waving and such. And I couldn't get to my parents' room. And then all of a sudden it just stopped. Mm. And um, I ran in my parents' room and, and then they put me back to bed where it yeah. happened. You're so like, oh, man, yeah. I came here for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I risked my life to get to you, yeah, mom and dad, and thanks. you're bringing me back in <laughs> yeah. there. And I, and I'll never forget that. There's a <laughs> yeah. lot that I can't remember in my childhood. Um, but that I'll never forget. And then, so anyway, back to being um, that night, I'm laying in bed and and I wake up and it, it's literally, I can't breathe. Like it felt like whatever this was, was standing on me. And I'm looking over to my ex-husband and he's just laying in bed, sleeping peacefully. Wow. And um, my Bible, again, was always open, always open. So 
I'm trying to grab it and I couldn't grab it. And I'm just like trying to breathe and I couldn't breathe. Mm. Um, and, but at this time you have to understand, I thought I was saved. So like what at this time I totally believed that demon possession could happen to Christians or demons could oh, okay. taunt Christians. Um, I was of that belief and I was able to like, finally just be like, Lord, please, Lord, please help me and get up and walk outside. I'm in my pajamas. And as I'm walking outside of the apartment, like all it looked like all the lights were off. And I made it downstairs because we were in a two-story apartment. Come to find out later, after, right after this happened, my mom lived in the same apartment building. What in the when world? When she was a teenager, like when Whoa. she when she was like a young adult. So like she moved out of Nana's house and lived in the same apartment building. That's weird. Oh, like crazy, crazy yeah, things that's really in our weird. family. Did she have experiences when she lived there? I don't know. I've never talked to my mom. I only talked to Nana about these things. So, so, so I go outside and like all the lights look dark. And I'm like running out to the grass and I'm just like, I can finally breathe. And I'm like, Lord, please make it stop. And like all the lights just like get bright again. Weird. Yeah. Wow. And so at that point, I was grateful we got orders to California. We moved to California and I was of the belief you can move and it won't follow you because that's what I was taught as a kid. Yeah. (laughs) So we moved and guess what followed me? That. Yeah. The entity. Yeah. So I deployed. Um. I, let's see, I moved and that was horrible. California was horrible. It continued to be horrible. Um, and I deployed to Iraq. Um, I almost lost my life a couple times, um, once in an explosion. And then when I, our plane was landing in Baltimore, a plane crashed at the wow, Baltimore. It's actually, at it's actually still there. Like the plane was so damaged. They use it as like firefighter training. So oh that was goodness. in 2009. Wow. And the plane is still there. Where were you in the plane when it crashed? Like- um, Actually, it was a DC-10. So I was actually in the middle, like right in front of the, the movie screen. And I thank God for that every day. I never sit in the middle aisle. I was in, so the middle aisle was five seats and then the three seats on the outside. And I was in the middle seat right with my feet up on the the movie screen. Wow. Did many people in that plane crash die? Um, no, I don't know if anyone ended up dying, but I know that everyone like in the back, like the luggage ballast like fell on them. And, oh and then goodness. the ones on the sides that were like on the inner, like the aisle rows, the, the luggage opened um, and the ballast fell on them and all the luggage side of it fell on them. And then um, the fire, like we had to stay on the plane because the firefighters had to take a lot of people out. So after yeah. that, can I, can I really interrupt for a second? So yeah. so uh, the first half of my career, I was aircraft maintenance. Mm-hmm. And so typically when you have something like a hard landing, um, they'll do like a, a repack of the struts and like they'll fix things, right? This plane was damaged. They hit the runway so hard that they couldn't repair it. Oh, the yeah. runway, the plane was about to go into like the river. So they had to take back off again, shut down the engines and glide back to another runway because, or another like taxiway because there was so much damn like, like debris on the previous taxiway. Yeah, so this wow. wasn't just a hard landing. This was like seriously. Yeah, it's yeah. a smash landing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's like the wings were like touching the ground when we finally landed. Like I remember oh we were going back around and being like, I could see the print on that guy's shirt. And he's like fishing, like looking up at like the plane. Like, wow, he's like, yeah. this is not good. Yeah. yeah. So, but the whole time I was deployed, they had chapel and I lived right, I lived, I stayed by the chapel, um, but the chaplains and I, I, this is not to say anything about individual chaplains in the military. Um, the chaplain corps in the military is not equipped for salvation. They are your friends. They are your counselors. You go to color, you go to get ramen noodles, you go to get Girl Scout cookies. Hmm. Um, so when I was deployed and I'm really needing assistance you go to chaplain corps to color or to open letters from boy scouts. Hmm. Um, they have like their little military new testaments. Um, and at that time I was flying from Baghdad to Balad. Um, we were getting shot at on our planes and, uh, and I was also working in the hospital. So going Baghdad, Balad hospital, Baghdad, Balad hospital, seeing a lot of death, um, trying to find respite in the, the chapel. There was no message. And I'm sure there was church, but it was not at a time that like you probably had to work a nine to five. But I worked like two days and nights, two days and days, two days and nights. No, that's totally true. Because when yeah. I was in, when I was in Iraq uh, in what 2018 is when I went there. Uh, same deal. Like she's like, oh, you're trying to go to church. I'm like, I can't. I work like every day. So yeah. yeah. Hmm. And so um, at that time, I really was like, all right, God, like 
I've almost died like so many times. Like the plane would land at the end of the runway um, to make sure that like, no one was shot. Like right. that kind of thing. Because wow. they, they would stop at the end of the runway because they're not going to taxi in if the plane's on fire. Right, yeah. Um, or someone's dead. They're just going to kind of like, the ambulance will meet you out there. Mm -hmm. um, and I had kind of just like given up hope at that point. Um, mm. So we come back at, and I I divorced my ex-husband, which again, is a, I want to make sh clear that that is against God's law. Like, But when there's not God in the marriage... Like, there's no hope for the marriage. So we didn't have hope. I actually had been going to a military chaplain before this while my, um, there was a very abusive relationship. And I'd been going to chaplain on base before my deployment. And he had said, like, well, this is what the Bible says about divorce. Your husband has to say that he wants to divorce you before you can divorce him. So I was staying in a very abusive relationship, still trying to seek what God's word said about my marriage while I wasn't saved and he wasn't saved. And, and the person you're going to for counsel is not, <laughs> not saved. actually yeah. knowledgeable about no, yeah. God's word. Um, and so I actually stayed in that marriage until he said he wanted to divorce me. Mm. And so that was way, a couple years too long. And I landed, I crash landed in Baltimore, you know, found out all my money was stolen by my ex-husband when I got to Baltimore. So it was like a whole like disaster. And I had just like given up, like all like God's not for me. God, I'm not on God's team or he's not on my team, you know? Right. Yeah. And and so where I, are you, God? Look at my life. Yeah. So I finally <laughs> make it back to California and I um, had severe PTSD. I had dreams about my crash, uh, realistic dreams about my explosion, the, the hospital. Um, it was a very, very tough time. I started drinking really bad. Um, grateful that I do not have an addictive personality and I did not let myself get into that. I actually had a cat at the time that uh, like woke me up out of like a real bad flashback dream. Mm. And uh, AJ hates that cat to this day <laughs> 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 because that cat did not like AJ. No, he only it liked did not. me. <laughs> that cat would punk me out every minute if it had the opportunity. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, so I um, found a church that was a Lutheran church. Um, got involved there, still thought I was saved. They don't verify your salvation. Um, became a youth leader. Crazy that they would even let me be a youth leader. I was living with um, my boyfriend at the time in a premarital sexual relationship, which mm. is just insane. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'm still searching God, still trying. And I ended up going on a the winter retreat. I'm still in the Air Force at this time. Go on the winter retreat with the youth and one of the teenagers comes up to me and says, I forgot my birth control. And I'm like, why do you need your birth control? Like, you're on a youth retreat with church. Yeah. You don't need your birth. She's oh like, well, I'm sleeping goodness. with, I mean, I'm sleeping in the same sleeping bag as my boyfriend. I need my birth control. And I'm like, we're in Tahoe and our church is in Vacaville. Like, we're not driving all the way. Like, we just shoveled snow to get in this like, house. No, you're not sleeping in the same, <laughs> yeah, like same so sleeping I go bag to with the your pastor. boyfriend. <laughs> yeah. I go <laughs> I to like, the youth no. pastor <laughs> and I said, hey, this is going on. And he's like, um... Well, that's for her and her parents to deal with. So if she wants to sleep in the same sleeping bag as her boyfriend, we have to call her mom and ask her mom to bring her medicine. Oh, my goodness. And I said, well, this church is not for me. And I stopped going after. This is so funny because we actually got staff pictures like the weekend before the right. <laughs> the youth retreat. And so <laughs> then I was like, mm, church isn't for me still. I didn't know that this is the state of church these days. Um, and I actually had like considered at this point, going to a Mormon church to go find a husband, like a mm. real husband. Wow. Um, but then I found AJ. Okay. And that's where AJ comes into my life. We met on Match.com. Oh, okay. Because at that time, I was like, had written off, like, every, my ex-husband was in the military, too. And I was like, I'm never going to date anybody in the military. And then <laughs> I find... funny as I said the same thing. <laughs> AJ, <laughs> who was in the military. And we actually almost worked together. And everyone at his work knew me, but he didn't know me. Oh, wow. And I didn't know him. Nope. So when he started dating me, everyone was like, oh, you're dating her? She's so cool. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> I'm pretty cool. <laughs> that's funny. But anyway, so she, that's where I my story comes to She is to pretty him. cool. I'll, okay. I'll admit that. So wow. On record. All right. So my so, wife is pretty cool. So bring us up to speed <laughs> up to speed with your life going up to where you met Brandy. All right. So <laughs> I was not short. searching for anything right. uh, at all at this point. Um I joined the military in 2008, so like about two years af uh, after she had joined. Um, 
I tried to do college at that point. My parents kind of were like, if you're going to live with us, you got to be going to school. So I went to school um, and then it kind of got, you know, really difficult being at home, being an adult, having to live under your parents' roof. Um, and so I was like, oh, I know, I'm going to go to a university. So I went to NAU and that didn't end well. Uh <laughs> the curse of Arizona College. Maybe. When I don't you're know. Not a Christian. It was just trying uh-huh. to escape my parents turned into a really expensive right, you know, mm. situation. Uh in fact, it was I I so I I got kicked out of NAU cuz they put me on like academic probation and they're like, "Hey, you need to leave and get your grades, you know, yeah, better uh somewhere else." <laughs> <laughs> and here. uh I was kind of I was like, "Man, what do I do with my life?" And I was working at uh, Avis and Budget Rent a Car. Okay. Um, and I worked with this old, salty, you know, retired senior master sergeant who was like, yeah, military is the best thing. You should join the Air Force. Well, you know. And uh, after a while, I was like, you know, maybe I will. It's because it's either this or I become a truck driver, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, and so uh, still not really thinking about God, still not really even considering anything. It was more like, as long as I'm a good person to other people, you know, that's kind of the, the the motto I lived by, which I was not very good to other people. Yeah, it's, so. more, it's more like, now what can I do to make a living? Yeah, and yeah. And in fact, at one point, it was like, financially it was bad enough that I, like me and this other girl that I worked with, uh, moved into an apartment together. She had a kid and a boyfriend who was like, did not like that I was living with her. Um, but like, it was the trashiest apartment ever. It was like one of those apartment complexes that's like, there's only four units. Yeah. And it was like $500 a month to live there and we yeah. split it and we still had a hard time making rent. Wow. Yeah. It was rough. Um, we used to live next to this guy that had like 15 cats. We used to call him the cat lady. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, I finally was like, I got in with the recruiters. They're like, hey, you know, whatever. And so I finally asked my parents, hey, can I move in with you guys while just while I wait to join the military? And they're like, okay, yeah. So I moved back down to Phoenix, joined the military, all that stuff. Um, and I had already deployed like twice before we even met. Like when I started deploying, when I got qualified in my job to be able to deploy, I had, I deployed for like almost a year straight. Like I went on one deployment. I was home for about a month. Then I went on a TDY for like another month or two, and then I went on another deployment. What's, like a, what's a TDY? Uh, TDY is like a short-term uh, temporary duty, whatever, temporary duty. Like Something, you just, yeah. Yeah, we ended up going to Australia and Diego Garcia and doing some secret missions to Afghanistan, moving cargo. No one knew who what it was. <laughs> wow. Yeah, we're just AJ. like, yeah, yeah, it was weird. Is that even your real name? <laughs> <laughs> Wait till you find out what he did after that. Okay, yeah. yeah. Well, anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was cool. I mean, I did get to go to Afghanistan. He's an international so super neat. spy. Whatever. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> um, <laughs> there was no denial. Did you see that? So, there was just the shoulder I'm not, shake. I'm not uh, <laughs> anything like, like that. Ugh, don't so, talk about this. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, anyway, yeah. So, so when we met, um, it was kind of, I, I mean, for me, it was love at first sight. I know it's kind of cliche to say, but... We met in this like dingy bar. It, it was, describes California. Yeah, it had bras and underwear on the wall. It okay. smelled like urine. It smelled like urine. Yeah, it was bad. Yeah. California, yeah. It was bad. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Um, California is amazing. Parts of it. Yeah. Uh, great place to visit. <laughs> so <laughs> we lived there for like six so or so long. Yeah, for a long time. Um, it was beautiful. Anyway, we met and she started pressuring me to go to church. And it wasn't it wasn't like a you need to go to church. It was like we need to really get involved in in church because we're our son, we you know we got a son on the way. Like I don't want to raise him without faith in our home. And at the time I was like, I don't want to do this. But I, but but I was like, okay, fine. Like if you want to do that, if it's going to make you happy, I'll go with you. Right. Um and for a while it was okay. We went to this non-denominational church um in where was it? It was in Vacaville. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh Come to find out, it's part of like the Bethel circuit. Oh, okay. So that's why it was great at the time. It was real great. I went there because spo- I liked the music. Until she spoke tongues. There was a over lady pastor, AJ, which was kind of weird uh, oh, when he was okay. deploying. Yeah, it was strange. Okay. And I was like, I did have one. <laughs> I did have one kind of strange spiritual experience when I was there. Um, like, pretty much, this is really. I did not think that I went there long enough to really any have anybody say anything. But since I was deploying. Like they called me forward and they like prayed for me and stuff. And I was like, oh, this is weird. Um, and then this, 
guy. I'd never seen him before ever. And then he disappeared me. after that. He came up to me and he gave me a coin, which mm. is like in the military, that's kind of a thing you do. Every squadron, every unit has a coin. Most military aligned organizations have a coin. And it's kind of like a, it's a traditional thing. You give someone a coin. It's, it's like a, the whole history of it is basically like during World War One, the these these guys, these pilots, they they all had these coins that they'd earned or they made for each other or whatever. And and um, one guy crashed and he got stuck behind enemy lines. And so when he tried to make his way back to um, the base, they almost shot him, but he had that coin with oh. him. And that's how they knew who he that he was telling the truth. That's wow. who he was. So the challenge coin thing is like a big tradition in the military. And so he gave me this coin. And it was like the, I don't remember the name, Patriot Riders or something like that, but it was a Christian motorcycle like organization club that they had a bunch of old privates or whatever. But I'd never seen the guy before in my life. And like the way he looked at me, like in his eyes was like, it like freaked me out. Cause I, it was like, there was something there, you know? And then, like I said, he gave it to me and then he like disappeared. And like, I remember when he shook my hand, it was like, he was like looking into my soul. Hmm. It was very weird. And, um, for me, it was like, oh, what is this, you know? Um, and I, I think, and as I look back on my life too, I really think it was like part of like God calling me. Cause like, I remember growing up, I had Christian friends. I listened to like Christian music that I didn't even know was Christian. Right. Um, one of my favorite bands is Thrice, you know, oh, okay, and, yeah. and Dustin Kensru like was a worship leader mm-hmm. for a while. And a lot of his music is very, very influenced by Christian uh, by the Bible and stuff. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, l- looking back on this memory and others, it's just like, wow, like God was really calling me to him for a long time before I actually accepted Christ. Um, and this was one of those instances. But uh, we moved, we moved. After my deployment, I changed jobs. Uh, well, I used to be a sensor operator on MQ-9 Reaper drones. Oh, wow. Uh, and so I had to come to Las Vegas for that job. And when we moved, we didn't really have a church and we didn't really think about where we were going to go or anything. It didn't really, you know, now it's like the first thing we think about. Like we moved here. We're like, okay, we're going to go to church. I was like, we're going to Apologia. And he's like, it's an hour or so away. I'm like, he's like, what are you going to do if you like it? And I was like, guess we're driving an hour every Sunday. Yeah. (laughs) An hour each way every Sunday. It took me like (laughs) three weeks before I was like, okay, finally, fine. We'll check it out. And then after we were done, I was like, yeah, we're going to be staying here. That's (laughs) fine. That's Time to funny. start saving gas money. I know, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we're actually moving closer. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, we we're going to a they're they're Canyon Ridge is part of. Should we say the name? I don't think we should say the name. Anyway, they're aligned okay. with a larger body. Yeah. Yes. And. Uh, so we were going there for a while and we, I remember we really liked it at the time because we could drop off our son. <laughs> yeah. And we're like, oh, we can actually sit together and enjoy. And he was a baby. The Christian church. date service. Yeah, yes. pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. And rock music. And then there was a smoking section outside. We didn't smoke, but like it felt like a rock service. We're like, right. oh, this yeah. is cool. Yeah. Pajamas. The, 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 I, the problem though for us after the kind of like, ooh, ah, I went away. It was like, I had no, we didn't know anyone. This church that had like probably a thousand people per service oh, we more. didn't i'm sure but yeah. they i mean their, their their sanctuary was like an auditorium you know right right and we didn't know anyone like at all and we would go there we'd show up for church we'd leave no one would talk to us we didn't have people would say hi you know the greeters and stuff yeah but we didn't have any sort of personal connection with anyone and so after a while we're like man this i don't know if we were like really like doing this mm-hmm. and for me i was still like oh yeah you know the music blah 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 uh, I, I still wasn't really looking for, for God. I was just kind of doing it. I was just doing it for her. I was letting her lead. I was just kind of like, whatever, if this right. is what you want to do. Uh, but I met someone when I was stationed in Las Vegas who was Mormon. Okay. And they invited us to a Christmas mm-hmm. party. Christmas cookie party. Yep, Christmas cookie party. And his wife and my wife actually became really good friends. And shortly after that, she started taking the discussions and I basically was like, okay, well, if we're, if we're doing this for our son, then I can get on board with that. I had a lot of good memories as a kid in the Mormon church. I had good friends, you know? Um, I mean, yeah, obviously there was some of the bad stuff I mentioned, but I did have some really good friends growing up. And, uh, I think 
for me, that was like, I want him to have friends like I had growing up. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of where I saw that coming from because it's yeah. what I knew. And so she started taking the discussions and all that stuff. And I actually got worthy so that I could take, so I could baptize her. So I actually baptized her into the Mormon church. Oh, wow. You know, what's crazy. Having done the missionary discussions or lessons, um, whatever you want to call them, they were called two different things for me um, at two different periods. Back when I was 18, taking the discussions, um, they were just a little pamphlet. Okay. Um, little small pamphlet. And there was actually one of the pamphlets that had planets on the front of it. So like actually got into Kolob and really discussing the terrestrial, like celestial, like those kingdoms, right? And and where we came from and where we're going. Right. Um, and now, or not now, but 10 years ago, I'm sure they're so different. Now they're on iPads and you don't actually get to hold them. But then they were little booklets 10 years ago. So I had little booklets, little fill in the blanks. And in the back, if I had questions, I could write it down. And mm-hmm. um, there was not one about planets. There was not a booklet that had planets on the front of it. I distinctly, like, I will, I, and I remember that. And so thinking about my missionary discussions, I guess, seven years prior, six years prior to that, I, they were completely different at the time. So I felt like the, the book was completed. Like the story was completed. All my questions I had before where it was baptized, 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 which might've right. just been the Little Rock mission. Like, um, that might have just been their thing because in the South, it's very different, which I'm going to touch on. That was one of the reasons I left the church was going back to the South as a Mormon. Um, there, like, there was a movie. So we got to watch a movie. It was Joseph Smith's death. Okay. Um, like a martyr. Oh, I remember his, watching yeah, that movie. So, yeah, yeah his, like his, yeah, his martyr. Like, um, I just called his death because he died. He wasn't a martyr. Right. Um, uh, he was killed for, for his his crimes. He um, shot back too. Yeah. Yep. That's mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Um, well, the reason they were looking for him was because of his, his criminal gross past. violation of the freedom of press. Yeah. yeah the Nauvoo expositor. Yeah. 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 And um, watching that, the emotion. So, so each time that they left in the Las Vegas mission, which like I said, and one of the things that I've noticed as I witness to Mormons now is that's not how my ward is. And I, and I want to make it clear that, each mission field may have different um, experiences. Each missionary that's listening to this may have different um, experiences in their mission field. Um, but in the Las Vegas mission where I was, it was very experiential. It was, I want you to take time and pray about this. And we're not going to come back for a week or two weeks. Hmm. Whereas in the Little Rock mission, um, six years before that, in 2005, it was, we're going to be back tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. And then I want you to know if you, you want to get baptized. Um, and that kind of change may have benefited the church, bringing in the experience and the emotions. Yeah. Um, because the emotions are what got me. After watching the Joseph Smith video, which was then, I believe, the same day that we had the Families Are Forever lesson, or right afterwards, was what sealed my my fate into the Mormon church. Um, it, for me, it was answering the questions that I had as a Christian. Where does Satan come from? Mormon church has an answer. Um, being content now as a Christian with knowing that I don't have to know everything and God will be there when I have the answer, when I get to heaven. And if I, and I you know, when I'm in heaven, I may not even have that question because I'll be so content. It won't matter. Um, but then my questions to the missionaries were, where did Satan come from? They had the answer. Uh, well, I know my husband in heaven. Because at that time, we were still like greatly in love. We had just had a baby. We were the prime subject, the yeah. prime like You can be with your family for, for eternity. E- yes, yeah. for eternity. And now knowing that, yeah, I may know my husband in heaven, but the love that we have is not even going to compare to the emotion and the moment that I have with Christ every single day in heaven. Right. On Amen. this restored earth. Like, it's not even going to matter. Mm-hmm. We may pa- be passerbys, but like, it doesn't matter. Right. Amen. The joy, I will sing hymns every day. And that's what like is missing. And so, like, when you would get mad, when I would get mad at my spouse on earth and think, this is the person I'm supposed to live eternity with, <laughs> like, oh, you know, 
like <laughs> no i mean it's true and you yeah, come to, you come yeah. to find out other things in the temple um about like that may not be your spouse in heaven but uh the guy that you guys had on for the ghost hunting episode kind of oh Jared on. Fawcett. oh my gosh that was amazing yeah yeah he, um yeah. but you know there there's things that you pick up on in the temple when you go enough like your spouse that you're sealed to the reason you get secret names is because you go to when you go to Mormon heaven and your spouse yells out that name right those are the spouses he gets your name mine was Camila yours was Alma yeah yeah another man the name he got at the veil may be different you know it's just like little things like that or I may not hear his call I may hear another guy yelling Camila and that's my spouse and in heaven. Oh, interesting. Here's I've what's weird too. And, I didn't and, find and this out till later. But it's a polygamous thing. So like he's going to get all the women in his realm that hear his name. And those are the things that break your heart when you find the truth. Like this is supposed to be my solo hus- husband Well, not to heaven. mention and that like, so when you're, everyone that went through the temple for the first time when we were going through got the same names. Yeah. So like everyone gets the same name yep. oh, that day. The names are by day. So yep. so you guys were you guys were sealed in the temple? Yeah. We were, and yeah. so like when you go to like the prayer circle in the front, there's a part of the temple ceremony where you veil your face. Yeah. And the men don't. Okay. That's for that's that part of the ceremony where like you're basically like saying like <laughs> and it's crazy when you watch the older temple ceremonies or you hear about them, they kind of gloss over it now and it's really when you get into the history of the church and what the purpose of that was which goes into the ces letter and like reading the footnotes um knowing that i may not hear my husband's call on that day and it may be another man and not only is it i'm not the only person to that man it's 10 other women Hmm. it's so heartbreaking so so how does it feel when you think about John 6 when it says that when Jesus says that I will raise him up on the last day or I will raise you up on the last day that yeah. your salvation is not by being called out by your husband whoever that may be it makes be, it but so actually... much easier to not be so angry at my husband right. for eternity but no, it's I'm actually it's actually Jesus <laughs> I love you but it's actually Jesus who yeah. says he will raise you yeah. up on the last day no it's beautiful because it's not determined yet again upon another sinner like everything in the Mormon church is dependent upon another sinner. Like there's a point where you realize I can't trust my spouse because they're going to go tell the bishop on me if yep. I share things with them. We lived that for a, lo- for a little while. Yeah. And it almost ended in our divorce. Mm-hmm. Mm. I was almost a second divorcee because of, and I felt like a failure. I felt like there was nothing I could do yet again. Like here I am in church following Christ and and like doing what I thought I was supposed to be doing and my marriage was going to fail again. Mm. And I remember just like being in church and like, and feeling not, there's never real joy. Like with my spouse, it was always like, you know, you have that thing now as a Christian, there's the memes that are so true, like angry, like arguing, like you're not getting ready fast enough. And then you get to church and you're smiling. It's not like that in the Mormon church. Like you are all out like spiteful, angry. And then you come to church and it's like, you have to pretend like you love each other. And I'm not, again, not saying it's like that for every relationship, but there's a lot of people I became very close to. And that was all of our experiences. Yeah. You know, well, there are some statistics you can look up about Salt Lake City in Utah in terms of opioid addiction. They call it an epidemic, uh, pornography addiction. All of these things are extremely high. They even have mm-hmm. a very high suicidal rate to, yeah. compared to the rest of the country. But I would say these are spiritual uh, manifestations of the state that these people are in. Imagine, I've said this multiple times, but imagine being a person who doesn't have the spirit of God that has to manifest all the fruits of the spirit. You know how hard that is? Yeah. It's impossible Mm -hmm. because only the Holy Spirit can truly manifest those things in somebody's life. Uh, It's called sanctification. Something's going to snap. You know, it's not a healthy. And it's going to be secretive probably. Yeah. And it's not a healthy way to live. We see that it expresses itself in multiple ways. Eventually someone becomes spiritually abused like you were spiritually abused. Like you, you went, I like to call it from out of the frying pan when you first left the church when you were younger and into the fire. You know oh, I mean? for sure. You, you didn't yeah. go to anything better. Mm-hmm. You had no hope. Yeah. And actually, uh, you know, speaking of that, I actually developed a pretty bad pornography addiction while I was a member of the church. And that mm-hmm. was part of the reason why our marriage was so terrible is because, you know, I had this secret sin that I was, you know, at times fighting, at times not fighting. Right. And I, I couldn't go to my spouse 
for any support. I couldn't go to her and say, I'm struggling with this. I couldn't do that because I knew that she was going to go right to the bishop and be like, he needs to do this. And they're going to be, you know, mm-hmm. there's going to be church discipline or, you know, however they decided to public, deal with that. Public church discipline. Like yeah, there's right. no private anything. Like there's no pastoral counseling. Like there's nothing. Like if anything goes wrong, it's it's public immediately. Yeah. There's um actually, I don't know. I can't remember if it's handbook one or handbook two. Yeah, I think it might be handbook one but essentially they have a book that's a guide yeah, book that tells them handbook. how yeah to how to how to handle certain situations mm-hmm. and i find that interesting because the jehovah's witnesses have a similar book as well it's called shepherd the flock of god of course i do and yeah. what's very interesting to me about that is well we already have the book mm-hmm. right it's right here and your pastor the elder who should be counseling you should be bringing you to the word using the holy spirit as conviction as a guide to help you through these situations not a handbook Right. Right. I mean, that's a big red flag in, in my thought process right there. But we already know there's also extra books that they have in terms of extra biblical revelation yeah. that don't help whatsoever either. either. But um, yeah. so so walk us through that. So you guys are in the Mormon church now. You got did you get rebaptized? Do they do that? So since I never had my name removed. OK. I was just inactive. Oh, OK. And so I had to do like a period of. Uh, did it prove yourself almost. Kind of, I basically had to become like when I, that's why I was like, get worthy get because worthy, yeah. it was like, um, I had to kind of basically like go through the things and like have meetings with the Bishop and like show that I've, I've kind of been improving. Um, but like, I didn't know that guy. Right. So I'm not going to tell him all the stuff I'm yeah. just struggling with. You're just doing what you can to be yeah, worthy. I'm like, to, Hey man, I'm yeah. good. Like I had some problems with this, but I'm fine now. And he's yeah. like, all right. You know, which says a lot about someone who's supposedly called of God and has like, you know. The Melchizedek priesthood. Yeah, yeah. and has the Holy Spirit to, te- to help him discern if people are maybe lying or not. You know what I mean? Right, yeah. Um, or maybe not maybe not lying overtly, but just being, you know, You should have master discernment. If you have the Melchizedek priesthood, you should be a very important yeah, person. Yeah, if you are yeah. like a Christophany, <laughs> you should have. Exactly. Exactly. The, Christ is the only one who holds the Melchizedek yeah. priesthood. Yeah. So if you have something that powerful. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I used to have the Melchizedek priesthood. It felt pretty good. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it felt nothing. I had no, there was nothing extra about that. So when you became <laughs> worthy, the steps that you took when you're going to the, back into the Mormon uh, faith, you weren't necessarily b- a believer or did you kind of make yourself or force yourself to trick yourself <laughs> to believe? How did that work? So this know, has created many post Mormon, um, conversations between AJ and I is like, why? So like, why? this is, well, okay. This is interesting that you ask him that. Cause I've asked him the same question many times. Okay. Yeah. yeah it's weird. weird. Okay. Like, so why I've... did you let me do this? And it's all cause God, that's the answer. Right. <laughs> well, now that we're out of our like anger, you know, the cage, shade, we've been out a few years. There was, there was like a, how come? And there was like, a why? You know? <laughs> um, so, well, okay. Let me back up a little bit. First off, um, you got to remember like where I was coming from. Right. So for me, it was like, all right, so I'm doing this for my wife. Right. She wants to do this. And, um, I'm just kind of, kind of go with it because I can live in the culture, maybe not necessarily be super involved in the doctrine. Cause you've done it before. Uh, yeah. And, and I knew many Mormons actually growing up who were that way, who straight up would be like, yeah, I don't really agree with everything the church says, but like, the, it, you know, yeah. I have the support. I, I can find a good job. My yeah. children are and here I learning. Think that's, yeah. You know, unfortunately, that's the kind of the, that's the case for a lot of people. Yeah, is that they they don't they just kind of accept the fact that that's how life is because they don't either they're not courageous enough or they don't they don't want to break up their family yeah. by by doing that. Where else am I going to go? Right, and mm-hmm. and for me, it was a little bit easier to leave because like my mom had already left at the time I left. Oh, um, or she was getting ready to. That's yeah. Um, the only remaining member of the church in my family is my older sister who is a Whitmer. Okay. So still. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. She's married to a Whitmer. Wow. Like one of the original, like family line from, like from the front of the book of Mormon. Original witnesses of the book of Mormon. Wow. Yeah. Okay. She's yeah. never leaving. Sorry, yeah. Amanda. We've I tried, try. we've, we've tried to <laughs> talk to her about stuff and then she just won't. Well, let's all yeah. pray for Amanda. Every, everyone who's listening here, Amen. Yeah. pray for Amanda. Um, so, uh, and actually I've got probably some more stuff to tell about that, but that'll be later on. Um, so, uh, at this point, and I, so she was talking about this emotional experience she had watching this, this video, right? For me, I'm sitting back there like, you know, because, and this is the weirdest part. I know that like the truth, cause when I had left, I'd kind of done some more research. I knew kind of the circumstances surrounding, 
uh, the death of Joseph Smith. I knew some of the things he was doing, but I didn't know specifically as much information as we got from the CES letter. So yeah. I knew and some of me, it. And for me, I'm watching it like, wow, if someone could die for their religion like that, I'm sitting next I to must just believe scoffing. it. And I'm saying that out loud, like if so, and crying, crying my eyes out. If someone could die for their religion like that, it must be true. Forgetting mm. Jesus. Right. No right. one reminded me of Jesus's sacrifice because right. they don't remind you of that. Jesus' sacrifice is like idolatry to think of Jesus on the cross, to have yeah. a cross in your home. Mm-hmm. And at this time, I want to say I was going to school to be a sommelier. Um, so I had like three to four thousand dollars worth of wine in our home. Um, and at, and I threw it away. Oh, for, wow. And I we threw that life away yeah. for the Mormon church. I actually used to, I used to brew mead too at the time. And and it was. I remember I mean, asking the missionaries about it. It was just crazy to think like what I gave up, um, I guess, like my future. Because in Las Vegas, that could have been very successful for us at the time. Um, I had driven wine tours in Napa. I was very knowledgeable about wine. Um, very, I was a very successful wine tour driver in Napa at the time. And then we moved to Las Vegas and I was continuing my sommelier school. Um, and it just the brainwash like it just that emotional experience yeah and them not reminding me there was someone sacrifice greater wow there was liberty greater than that freedom yeah. greater than that your heart is deceitful above all things desperately mm-hmm. sick mm-hmm. who can know it jeremiah 17 9 we we all know that verse here and it's it's a very very true thing that yeah. is that is powerful make you give so many things up but yeah keep Keep going, man. Talk to us about that. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And I remember, man, I remember like whenever she would have me sit, because I didn't go to all the discussions, but I went to a number of them. Yeah, you were at work a lot. Yeah. Or sleeping. Yeah. Because I was working. Because you're a secret agent. We know. Yeah. Secret international. (laughs) We already know AJ's a secret agent. So, Uh, it's a tiring job. (laughs) I've seen seen James Bond. Yeah. 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 So, um, so she would have these discussions and then she'd come talk about about them to me later. Or like, I remember being. And Mormon friends were there. The yeah, missionaries, they would be there because too. he couldn't be there, they would always make sure that there were other Mormons there. Oh, wow. Okay. The whole time. Even when he was there, other Mormons were there. So it was not just me taking the discussions or just him taking the discussions. It was two missionaries, sometimes three, four, mission president, him, me, and like two or three other people. Yeah. Hmm. It was very interesting. That is very interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I kind of remember having this feeling of like, yeah, whatever, you know. If and and I kind of had like a really lackadaisical um, approach to the whole thing. It was more like if she wants to do it, that's fine. And I still had my own kind of beliefs about like issues I had with the church and all these different things. And I remember uh, challenging or asking questions to the missionaries at the time, and. Uh, I don't remember. It was kind of like a negative thing. Like they kind of were just like, nah. they kind of ignored. Yeah, they ignored you yeah. pretty much. Yeah, because you were already a member. Yeah, hmm. pretty much. You and were coming with me whether they I were. I think they knew yeah. that. Yeah. Um. So so anyway, uh, I knew that what was kind of expected of me was to, you know, I felt like I had to follow her with this. And, you know, I didn't really know any better. So... Like I said, I got worthy. We, um, I baptized her, and that was actually. It was really spiritual. It really was. It was really strange. Actually, I remember. Yeah. But now I know the spirit that it is. Right. But it was one of the most spiritual moments that I've ever had in my life. Extra spirit, like external spiritual. Now I know what a real spiritual conversion feels like. Explain, okay. explain it real quick. The the spiritual experience with the baptism. Well, real quick before was, I get into that, it was lit. I didn't oh, okay. have the same. <laughs> The same Sorry. upbringing that she did, as far as um, experience with supernatural you know, things. Supernatural things, yeah. I, I remember, man. I remember praying earnestly for God to show me something, like my whole childhood. And I remember, like the height of my Mormon experience was when I was deacon quorum president. You know what I mean, like that that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But I never had like the oh we went to do baptisms baptisms for the dead and I saw an angel or right. I was sitting in sacrament meeting and there was an angel looking down on the bishop or whatever like I never saw anything like that but I grew up with yeah, people Jesus, telling Jesus me those me stories. Jesus found me in the temple hallway alone and came and spoke with me. I've yeah, heard that one. I've That's I've scary. never mm-hmm. experienced anything like that. You know what I mean? And I remember like praying, like reading my scriptures and like praying that that you know for God to show me something and I never ever saw anything but when we were in the baptismal font 
together. Satan was not going to let me go from the Mormon church. It was it was nuts, man. Like I remember and it like well, I said I felt it too, which was which was significant to me because like I said I I'd never experienced anything like that before. Um for her I guess it was kind of old hat, but uh, no, it was it was <laughs> it was light. It was not. It was it was very weird. So to hear after we left the Mormon church and we were at the church, which we'll get there, the church we first went to the day we left the Mormon church, um, we went to a Christian church to hear, you know, Satan comes disguised as an angel of Second light. Second Corinthians 11. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, that is that was Satan. And it was like a cloud of light. It was everyone else disappeared. Yep. And, and it was just us two, like, it was looking just at us each other. Two. No one else was there. And we, it we was, felt like, I don't even know how to, it was yeah. like, it was like our souls were touching. Yeah. And, and like, it was. outside of us. Yeah. And, and we like I said, everyone, everyone disappeared. And I remember we, I was talking about it afterwards and it was he like. He asked me, wow. did you feel something? I'm like, yes, let's talk about it. Wow. Yeah. It was bizarre. That is mm-hmm. very bizarre. Um, I mean, now, like I said. Then it was bizarre. Now I know exactly what it was. Right. Um, but for us to finish each other's sentences as we were both talking about the experience mm-hmm. um, was just insane. And that was a test. And now we know why there's Mormons that will never leave Mormonism when they have right. experiences like that. Yep. Yep. And I And I want them to know that get into your Bible and read your Bible and understand like what the darkness can come as, like what the darkness can disguise himself as. Yeah, well, it's it's very and especially in Deuteronomy. Yeah, it's very interesting too. In Second Corinthians eleven, that's the same section where Paul is warning that there's people who will come and preach a different Jesus, a different mm-hmm. gospel, mm-hmm. who will accept a different spirit. Yeah. And then halfway through the chapter, he brings up Satan masquerading, or masquerading as yeah. you know angels of light. Uh, they look like they're doing works of righteousness, but when you read the end of the paragraph, you're it miserable says, in it. Yeah, it says yeah. their mm-hmm. ends will. They, they will meet their ends, which is the mm-hmm. ways of death. So although it looks legit, although it feels legit, if it's a different Jesus, a different spirit, a different gospel, yeah. the end is death. And even in Proverbs 11, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. And it's a, it, it makes perfect sense, too, in a religion that pries on emotional experiences, like in James 1.5. If any of you lack wisdom... Let him ask of God, yeah. Let him ask of God, mm-hmm. even though there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom yeah. in biblical terms, and that's not what the text is specifically saying. But instead of saying, hey, let's be like the Bereans in Acts 17.11, where when Paul and Silas go and preach the gospel yeah. to the And to they're the, like, oh, people, no, we're going to go read yeah, the scrolls. They, we'll be RB. Yeah, 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 yeah. we'll be RB. <laughs> we're going to go read the scrolls in the synagogue. Yeah. And they come back, and they're like, wow, you know, this is legit. I see Christ and the mm-hmm. gospel proclaimed all throughout the Old Testament. Why? Because I searched through God's holy word. Word, no, don't trust the word, trust your experience. And then once you believe the experience, guess what? God's word's not full. Right. It's missing many plain and precious parts. It's been translated incorrectly multiple times. And guess what? You can become a God one day of your own planet. It's the same lie from the beginning of the garden, right? right. It yes. says, did God say that? And guess what? You will be just like him if you eat the fruit. So it's a it's very interesting, yeah, that you that you bring that up because I think Second Corinthians eleven is such a beautiful text of scripture that a Christian can use to help show an LDS person because, like you said, there's a lot of people that won't leave because of these experiences. And our heart as Christians, when we look at these people, we got to go, look, I was once dead in my sin and trespasses, and I want you to know the holy Jesus. If if the devil has a hold on you, guess what? There's only one one person mm-hmm. who can take that hold away, and that's Jesus. Why? Because he created Lucifer. He's not the spirit yeah. brother of Lucifer. He's not the beck and women call Yeah, they didn't of fight Lucifer. for the position. They didn't fight one third. There was not a favorite whole, son. Yeah, the, yeah, there was no favorite <laughs> son situation going on. No, Jesus was the creator of Lucifer and Colossians 1 explains that. John 1 explains that as well. But it makes me, it makes perfect sense to me though that their people would have extremely emotional experiences. We see that with Mormonism. We see that in the new age. Yeah. Uh, multiple false religions have these emotional experiences experiences but what's funny is god's word literally tells us to die die from our emotions and submit to the word of god that really convicts us to put our emotions aside and yeah. follow the true and living yeah. god this is the book that says no 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 no. your emotions are leading you astray it's just so interesting <laughs> to me for a religion like mormonism um that focuses so much on keeping journals and written records mm-hmm. how much has to be left out because if for us to if we were to go and journal the baptism experience, which I did, um, I don't have it anymore, but to, if I had kept journaling 
and maybe wrote about four hours later where my husband and I were at each other's throat and we were arguing with our family Mm. and how miserable the rest of the day was. Those are the things that are forgotten because you're only writing about the good things. Oh, wow. And um, like even going to the temple, we were like to get sealed. It was horrible. And even after we left, we were miserable. Yep. So we were miserable in it. We were miserable at it. We were miserable through it. And like, but after we left, it's like, everyone's like, oh my gosh, wasn't that so wonderful? Aren't you so in love? Isn't it so great you're sealed in the temple? And it's that indoctrination the second you walk out. And in my brain, I'm like, no, that was horrible. No, that was miserable. And everyone's like, Satan doesn't want you to be here. Satan's not going to want you to be to the temple. The, everything's going to prevent you from getting there. So when you're fighting in the car on the way to the temple, just know that it's Satan. No, when you're fighting in the car on the way to the temple, it's God. God telling you to stop and turn around and go find a church like right. that. Like, I mean, those are the things like I cannot believe looking back, like wake up call. And, you know, it's and it's like someone needs to tell them like and I have such a heart for them, like the LDS people. Like if you're listening and you're about to get sealed at the temple, you will fight on the way to the temple. And if it's not on the way to the temple, it'll be at your little barbecue afterwards. Mm. And like that, it's and, and it's so common that it was a thing. It was a thing. Don't worry about your fighting before the temple. It will happen. Everyone fights before they go get sealed. Hmm. Like that it's a trope. It's like. Uh, yeah, we got wow. warned about it. Wow. That's yeah. very, the bishop very interesting. tells you, like I everyone tells you, just keep going. It's just, don't turn uh, around. It's just oppression in a sense. It's just temptation. Mm-hmm. It's just. Yeah, uh, don't just don't let Satan stop you. Hmm. And. And it's just yeah. Don't don't yeah. Forget the fact that your heart is desperately wicked, right? And that we follow the whims of our hearts. And yeah, you know, a lot of times what we perceive as Satan is really just us, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or God There's calling a- <laughs> us, or God calling us to not go do it. Right. This yeah. is your time to stop. Yeah. Like there was a time we were LDS and we went to a Christian church. Eh, Christian, eh. but um, there's church and we went for their Christmas ceremony. Oh yeah. Okay, and we I were, I was desperately trying and I, God calling me throughout my LDS time. And I was like, Oh look, this looks fun. Let's go see what it's going to be like. Um, this is like a big thing. And like at that time, the Mormon church, like the relief society and stuff, they were like, you should do the K love challenge. So like, they're like pushing you to do the K love challenge, which I mean, I don't know if that says a lot about K love, right. but um, <laughs> or like Christian rip music these days. But um, we went to this Christian church for their Christmas ceremony and they're preaching the gospel of Taylor Swift, boom, right into Mormonism. Mm-hmm. Wait, wait, wait. So, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> yeah. Say that a little bit slower okay. for me. The church, the church, we, the went church to, we went to, this, this pastor gets up and they, well, first off, they had like Cirque du Soleil, Soleil Dan, this in Vegas. Like yeah. people coming down from the rafters on like you have ribbons. Like light up bracelets, they that had, rave. Yeah. I mean, okay. it was like a whole ordeal. And then he gets up there and this guy starts talking about, like he talk, he like introduces His, my sermon today is the gospel of Taylor Swift. Yeah. And he's talking about her. Let me show you in how, the Bible yep. where it tells you to shake it off. Mm-hmm. And yeah. we got up and left and people followed us out. And I said, well, God, I guess Mormonism is real. If this is what's oh, going man, on in the Christian so churches. That's so sad. That's yeah. so sad. Yep. And we were in another two, three, like two, three years after that. Connor was a baby. Yeah. Okay, so you're so you're. Did you guys dedicate him? Do they do baby dedications? Well, he didn't because he was too old to get dedicated. Oh, yeah, they usually okay. do it yeah. for like newborns. Oh, so he yeah. wasn't born in the Mormon no, no, church. No, no, no. He, he was, was already he was eighteen born. months. Oh, we, okay, yeah, yeah. gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so tell me, tell me how, what was the exodus like? What what got oh. you guys to leave? Okay, so we were almost <laughs> about to get divorced <laughs> okay. because of. Well, but, well, oh, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, so we we had a time when we were living apart. Um, I was about, I was getting ready to get out of the military, but I was still kind of stuck there until my time was up and she had accepted a job, a lady that she had worked for virtually wanted someone to be there to work for her physically. And so they had just moved to Georgia. She's like, Hey, come out to Georgia. I'll pay you more, whatever. And at the time, because of our involvement in LuLaRoe. Don't say the name. Okay. An MLM. An MLM that I was kind of pressured to join to because it's Mormon roots. Yeah. Um, It was, you should join this for your family. And it was very Mm -hmm. culty. Very culty. It was actually really. All right, hold on. I'll clap, clap for that. (laughs) Okay. All right, just edit that that out, Gabe, where Lula Rowe is said and just continue with the MLM. All right, ready? Set, go. Okay, so. Okay. (laughs) Sorry, sorry, my bad. Sorry, Gabe slash Carmen. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm sorry, Gabe. Yeah, I'm totally like, kidding, bro. Don't say the name. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Anyway, um, go ahead. Okay. So 
we had a time where we lived apart. Okay, ready? Three, two, one. So there was a point at which we lived apart for a time. I was getting ready to get out of the military, and she accepted a job with a lady um, who was, she was previously doing a virtual assisting with, and she wanted someone to be there to do physical, like, personal assistance. Um, and we were kind of in a bad financial situation due to an MLM that my wife had been a part of for, what, like a year at that point? Yeah, like two years. Okay. Yeah. Um, but we had, she'd been introduced to it from people from church. Yeah, I was like one of the first people to join it because it was um, Mormon. It has Mormon roots. And at that time, they were really only having people join that were LDS. And a lot of the women at my church were like, you should do this. You could provide for your family. You mm. can do this for your family. And yeah. um, I ended up joining and found there was special treatment for LDS. And there were all these other things for LDS people. Oh, and wow. um, ended up putting us in almost a foreclosure. Oh, so they no. their tenants were basically the same, you know, as it was if, more when you a, were LDS, the pressure was different than if you weren't. So they okay. knew. So I was invited to different things because I was LDS. I got it was really interesting. Yeah, well, that's we even, very interesting. We got to the point where we were like, um, we we're which is insane to me. Like I was a staff sergeant in the military at the time. So like we should have had plenty of money. And Unfortunately, though, and they, I was making a good. I had a you good were making job a lot outside. of money too, but the problem is that all her money, all her extra money, went back into the business. Right, and so, um, so we started having problems with our mortgage, and and we went to the church for help. Hey, like we're having a problem, right? And they're like, well, we can't help you pay your mortgage, but we can offer you food. Just keep tithing, and yeah. that was man, that was so hard. Because yeah, the bishop sat across from us one day at our dining table and said, I see that you didn't tithe last month and you owe us about a thousand dollars or thirteen hundred dollars. So he you, said, Oh? Yeah, like you're back you back you're back tithing is about thirteen hundred dollars. They don't say that. Oh, so okay. you're backed in tithing about thirteen hundred dollars. Um so if like I can't offer you any like food assistance because you are like basically in debt this thirteen hundred dollars oh for goodness. tithing. Um, so once you pay that, because you make plenty of money, you should be able to, uh, I will be able to give you food assistance. Then you can go to the pantry and get some cans right. of Right. So soup. we paid yeah. the $1,300 to the bishop that day, sat there, and our mortgage was $1,310. Oh, my goodness. So, yep. And then we got beans and rice mm -hmm. for that. So that's the pressure. He said, you know, if I make, if I can tithe $10,000 a month, there's no reason that you can't tithe a thousand dollars a month. You should be able to figure it out. Not right. in my brain thinking this guy has been LDS his whole life and prepared for tithing from birth. Mm -hmm. We've been LDS for about two and a half years. This is new to us. Like to go from not tithing, you know, a thousand to two thousand dollars a month, like to now having to tithe a thousand to two thousand dollars a month. My That's a big hit on your budget, especially when we were living strapped. Yeah, we, we had two brand new cars, a brand new house we'd built. Um, and we weren't like very financially responsible. And so like his lesson was like, this is going to teach you to be financially, or you need to tithe, have faith in God, blah, 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 blah. But, um, on the flip side, because we were tithing, we thought that that's why we got our brand new house, our brand right. new cars. You're being blessed because yes. of your tithe. Yeah, right. yeah. And here we were about to be in foreclosure. Well, and that's not to mention like all the materialistic kind of keeping up with the Joneses thing that we had to deal with too, or not had to deal with, but we were kind of the got $300 caught up in. A it's month. the culture. Yeah. The yeah, $350 and, a month gym membership, because that's where everyone went. But when you live yeah. by doctors and dentists and that's the ward you're in, mm -hmm. um, it's kind of hard to keep up with them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, our I mean, bishop was a lawyer. It's so crazy because I'm like, know, with a very back, successful practice, it's to look back and be like, I shouldn't have done those things. And it's really stupid for me to say, oh, I did it because everyone else did it. But that's the culture. Yeah. Right. Like, that's. And I actually, yeah. I, I know we're trying to get to the end yeah, here, but sorry. I really want to get back into because you were asking so me sorry. why. Like, I don't know how, how much time we have as we're I'm talking so sorry. about. <laughs> no, it's, so this sorry. is an extended episode of okay. Cultish, and I'm having a great time with okay. you guys as right, guests. So I want you guys to know that. Sorry. Good. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm actually thoroughly enjoying <laughs> okay, this. Okay, so sorry. Yeah, so I kind of want to go back because I, 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 I'm still as we're talking about this, I'm like, why did I do this? And and I think honestly, at that point, I, I think I was. I'd finally kind of given in to maybe search for God. I was like kind of giving it another try. Like, okay. hey, I want to give this. I remember like like our elders quorum president was a good friend of mine and we were home teaching partners mm. or companions or whatever they call it. Uh, and I remember like 
I remember going and trying to be super diligent about that stuff while dealing with the problems we're dealing with at home, while dealing with the financial stuff and like not putting together any of it that, hey, maybe we shouldn't be doing this, you know? Yeah, it was uh, never the church's problem. It was our yeah, problem. Yeah, it was always us, We weren't right? praying enough. We weren't tithing enough. We weren't happy in our marriage. Maybe we needed to go to the temple and do another endowment ceremony. Yeah. Like, stuff like that. Like, it, we always turned it against ourselves or each other. Yeah. Mm. I would tell him, I just don't know why you can't be like the other husbands at church. Oh, man. Yeah. And I, re- I mean, I do. I feel really bad for that. But, I mean, I, he forgives me. Yeah. It was a different time. But I yeah. still, like, ugh, to say that to your husband is really bad. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I remember specifically like sitting in, and this happened more than once. Sitting there as we're doing lessons to or talking with our uh, our 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 families that we we're home teaching, like just thinking, being like hearing a voice in my head, like this is all a lie, this is all bull crap, like this is not, you know what I mean? And and mm-hmm. me being like, oh, that's Satan trying to get me to, you know what I mean? And I, I, thinking about it now, it's like I bet you that was God, probably trying to tell me like, hey man, you shouldn't be here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I remember I remember multiple times thinking that and then also like in the midst of prayer, like praying for this family, hearing like this is all a lie. This is all a lie. And and I still was like, nah, this is what you know and a lot of it I think was fear too. Like I didn't want to admit to my to my wife, I think really, that we shouldn't be here. I made a mistake. I should never have let you get involved with this. I, I should was have, so full in. I, and and yeah. and she asked me after the fact too, like, how come you never told me about your experiences in the church growing up? Because I never really did. I never really shared with her the the reason why I left or really much of anything. And so when she took the discussions, it was just like um, she almost went into it with you know kind of fresh eyes almost, and and none of and and that was also another thing too. I didn't want to like taint her opinion. Because I was very much like, well, this is her thing. Like, right. I didn't look at it as like a fam- familial responsibility or even, you know, how, biblically how you're supposed to look at it as that the father is the spiritual leader in the home. And it's up to me. It's my job to raise my wife and my child, my children, you know, wash them in the word. I, I, you know, I wasn't doing anything like that. Right. And, and even so, when we were LDS. Yeah, it was really I was the one running family home evening. I was the one doing the conference stuff like preparation. Um and to try to get him to participate was another was another fight. It was another argument. I just don't understand why you won't do this. And then it would come back to like, well, it's because you have this addiction and you don't want to even be with our family. And, and you know, it would always go back to him, him being the issue, never the church. Right. Never like the church being the problem, never the fact that we were in a cult. Yeah. Yeah, it's a twofold issue. It's a sin issue, and yeah. there's no um, answer for the. There's the no hope, hope yeah, that's given no, in the organization. No yeah, it's just yeah. pointed back at you, like, no, you should really pay that thirteen hundred dollars, not your mortgage, so we yeah. can get you some beans and rice from the pantry. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so we're living apart. Things are pretty rough. I wasn't going to church. You know, I, I actually kind of went into like a pretty deep depression. Started drinking a lot, and 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 just you know. Well, I live. Uh, this is when I was in Georgia. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I jumped forward. Anyway, so we're yeah, we're living apart not doing, I'm not doing great. She's going to church talking to me about how like, you know, oh, it's so great over here and blah, blah, blah. I was lying. (laughs) (laughs) He was lying to me about drinking. I was lying to him about how great church was there. Yeah. Yeah. And there was a couple of times too, where she, cause we used to have, uh, so when you're in the flying community, as I was, uh, we would have things called like namings and, and different events where we'd go out after work and a lot of it involved drinking. And I would tell her like, oh, I'm, I go there as the DD. She's like, they're really abusing you as the DD. <laughs> oh, we would get in like huge fights. I'm like, you don't even need to go. This is stupid that you're going. And he's like, well, I'm the DD. And I'm like, oh, so they're just abusing you because you're LDS. They know you don't drink. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, we still make jokes. I still give a hard time about it. <laughs> <laughs> the things we did when we were sinners. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> we're, we're still, still sinners. sinners. <laughs> <laughs> we were extra deep. We were I know fried what deep. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I know yeah. what you mean. <laughs> Unrepentant, unsaved sinners. Yeah. Yes. Um, deep fried Oreos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> deep fried Oreos. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you sully the name of deep fried Oreos like that? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, all right. So so then, you know, I, I get out of the military. I move out to Georgia. And uh, we finally are living together. It had been like a year, I think, at this point. We'd been living apart. Yeah. Um, it had been a while. It was it was kind of weird, honestly. Um, and we both kind of had to adjust a little bit. But she's like, let's go to church, you know? And I'm like, Ugh. And uh, it kind of was back to the same 
you know, problems with going to church and stuff. But the whole time he's gone, I'm going to a church that is nothing like this picturesque LDS church that you see on the front of LDS living. Right. Yeah. So the the church I call uh, Nevada and Utah the motherland. Uh, the like is obviously the church. So I'm, I call this the, not our Arizona. I would Arizona it. is the redheaded stepchild. I, I call, was going to say I would include Arizona. Yeah, in that, Arizona's but, a lot of LDS. Yeah, yeah, but okay. So I know it's true, but there's something different about L, like Las Vegas being like three to four hours away from. Like That's two true. hours it's from St. George, right. three hours of Salt most Lake people, City. Most people that are Mormon yeah. that live in Vegas are from moved there Salt from Lake. Utah. Like right. they're yeah. from there. They're not like, they don't have kids and just continue growing. Like in Arizona, you find people that like were Mormon from Salt Lake. They pilgrimaged here and now their family is here. Right. No, that's like the pilgrimage is from Salt Lake to Las Vegas every other drive, year. Yeah. 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 Like they just have move back and forth because they're business. I mean, St. George is only a couple hours away. So yeah. we would, we would yeah. go to St. George like on the weekend so, and stuff. For me to go from where the pressure is beauty, uh, spending $400 a month on hair, uh, being pressured into weight loss surgery, which I never did. I never went to Tijuana for that, thank God, um, because I've heard some horrible stories about women who did. Well, it wasn't Uh, just that, too. Didn't they do, like, uh, plastic surgery and stuff, too? Yeah, yeah. So, like, this is my circle, you know? And, like, it, it was just really scary the drugs, like like the antidepressants, stuff like that, to know that this was happening in Las Vegas, to go to Savannah, Georgia, where you had to drive an hour from church and where I was told by the Relief Society president that if everyone in Savannah, Georgia decided to be active one day, there would be 600 people per ward. There was maybe like 150 in the entire church building at any given right. time. And people had to drive an hour to two hours to go to church. Whew. So like that, and there was... and. 600 yeah, people compare- per ward for four to five wards. So there are about 3,000 inactive members in like the Chatham County area of Savannah, Georgia. Mm. Um, and that's just insane. Yeah. Like just people, just Mormons, Mormoning, just Jack, well, and, Mormons. And talking <laughs> about the difference in, in, in yeah, the and so, culture so I would too. Go what, to what, church. Did you, what did the Relief Society president so tell you in every- Vegas? Oh, hmm. I was at home one day and my doorbell rings like 8.30 at night in Vegas. And I, we had a three-story house. Our living room was on the top floor. So to go from the front door to the third floor, uh, you kind of see our house, right? You can't avoid our bedrooms or whatever. So I go downstairs and my Relief Society president standing on our front door, um, which takes you up to the second floor. And I open the door and she's like, hi, I'm just checking on you. I know your husband's deployed, just seeing how you're doing. And I'm like, um, I'm good. <laughs> and like, she's like, can I come in? I'm like, sure. So she walks from so like on the landing you can kind of see downstairs into my son's like playroom and then she kind of looks down there and then like goes upstairs to the, the living room sits down on the couch and she's like um if jesus were to walk through your door right now he would leave oh and i'm like oh okay well I, you weren't even invited so like, in my brain, like, <laughs> but i mean that's that's the kind that's of the culture, culture we're in, in, yeah. in las vegas very very right. materialistic very yeah. like outward so, and my appearance. house isn't even that dirty like I mean, it was at times, but at that time it wasn't. And so I was kind of like, ugh, like, bye. And so I didn't, like, you're not welcome here. And so then to go to Georgia, where people are wearing, like, Cookie Monster pajamas to church and and slippers, Hmm. and, like, the bishop had, like, uh, was a known alcoholic. Oh, wow. And they would go to bring, like, food to some of the people because it was very like um, low income and there would be like empty beer cans outside their their home and stuff like that was completely different experience for me yeah um and i was shocked i felt like the church uh, had left these low income churches to kind of just survive on their own low we would show up to church low tithing low income churches we would show up to church in like you know full suit like i had a couple full suits yeah Yeah. and there was one other utah well there was a colorado mormon there she was there because her husband was in the military we were the only two people really that showed up like like we had been cultured to like yeah and and everyone else is like one girl gave a talk on the word of wisdom on how to read a nutrition label like that like that is it wasn't even about the word of wisdom. It was how to read a nutrition label. And I think I sat there and I was like, this is what they give talks about here. Like, it was very um, shocking to me. And I felt like because it was low income and because this church wasn't pro- like like sending enough money that the, the main motherland had just, just like, about them. yeah, left them to their own devices. Um, 
same the missionaries uh the, the female the sister missionaries they lived in a very poor part of town and were harassed by male neighbors and the church didn't do anything to help them and so there was a lot of times they would just be at my apartment because they didn't have anywhere to go and they didn't feel comfortable being in the house that the LDS church provided for them right and so it was just and they and no one did anything hmm. and the mission president was far away so it was just crazy to they were in Augusta which is a couple hours so it was just crazy to think that that like that that happened like in my mind i i thought it was like an injustice like this is the biggest injustice i've experienced right which it's not my biggest injustice was being a white woman in iraq and being told i shouldn't be allowed to be here because i should be having children oh okay by you know by the locals yeah. um that i mean to tell you that's what i experience in life but uh and being my life threatened because of that like yeah. you know what i mean yeah 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 um so at that time, being LDS, that was the biggest injustice I experienced. Not being told I needed to pay thirteen hundred dollars to have food. Right, right. Um, How yeah, that seemed like a normal thing to us. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was normal. That was well, normal. It, it's it's seeing these these young women are probably eighteen, nineteen years yeah. old, and they're in a sketchy part of town in Georgia, and then the organization's not doing anything to help them. They yeah. can be physically harmed. They didn't even have harmed. food some nights, so like yeah. I would be feeding I can, them. I can understand seeing that and being like, well, where's the consistency? Where's the care? Where yeah. is the love of God within this organization? Why are they leaving them? And they were uh, joyful. Like, and they would tell me, like, you're not allowed to tell anyone that we're telling you this. Right. And I'm like, who am I going to tell? Like, I don't even know anybody here. Yeah. And so, like, that's scary, too, that, like, I was the keeper of these missionary secrets. Yeah. You know, and there was one time they, like, fleed to my house. Um, the the elders, too, uh, I call them brother missionaries because they're not elders by the Bible. Um, but the young male missionaries, they, um, they fleed to my house. There was a church member who had called the missionaries and was like, y'all got to come here now. Um, I have this whole Baptist church ready to convert. And so the missionary showed up to their house or to the church, the Baptist church on like a Wednesday evening, which in the South, that's dinner time. Mm. 6 p.m. at a Baptist church on, on Wednesday, that everyone's potlucking or right. picnicking. Um, and they almost got shot. They were met at the doors with guns and they were about to get shot by Dang, this Baptist Christian church. church? Yeah. Wow. Because the Mormons were coming to proselyte. Right. So think of Baptist at a barbecue. It's a Mormon movie. It's pretty funny. It was Mormons at a Baptist barbecue. <laughs> I want to so, watch it again, actually, actually from, the, from the Christian perspective yeah. now that I'm not a Mormon. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, and they fled to my house. And they're telling me about this this church member and, and then how she's done this many times, put the missionaries' lives at risk. Wow. And I, you know, in my mind, I'm like, is the church going to do anything about this? Like, I'm like appalled. You know, and they're like, no, the church won't do anything about it. You know, they think that she's doing good for the church. A bishop's not going to do anything about it. Well, that wasn't the first crazy. She would say some weird stuff in yeah. in in church. So, but no one silenced anybody. Right, like it yeah. was very much like a ever almost everyone there was a convert. The bishop was a convert. Um, so you have to think it's a whole church full, full of converts coming from everything: Pentecostal, Baptist. Yeah. You know, you got everything. You got a mixed bag, and there's no lifers that's what i call them lifers right yeah. to show set the example well and, and here's the here's the key problem here and you touched on it a little bit earlier but like growing up in the mormon church um the emphasis was not learn your bible it was uh it was like oh you need to read the book of mormon that was kind of the big push was to read the book of mormon it wasn't so much the bible and and there was a lot of cherry picking obviously. Uh, and so what you have here in this situation specifically is you have a group of converts. A bunch of people that know their Bible. They don't really... Well... You know, what I'm saying is that yeah. the members of the church there don't really know the the Word of God. They don't really know the Bible. They're inter encountering people who maybe do know the Bible in a lot of cases, but for the most part, not knowing the truth of God's Word. And... And then just people kind of just have their own wild theories about things. And I, I experienced this growing up too. You'd have you'd have a Sunday school teacher tell you one thing, and it would be like their interpretation of the church's interpretation of something. Because you know they have manuals, right? Right. So they would read through the manual and be like, "Oh, well, this is what this says." And you'd get you'd get all these crazy theories left and right f about you know maybe like one passage of scripture and. No one looked at it in like maybe the whole context of a book or a chapter or or yeah. anything, right? There was none of that. I experienced that. 
Yeah, and and that was actually something I really, when we actually did leave the church, um, I had a hard time with. I really did. Was trying to figure out how to actually properly read the Bible? Well, that and um, unlearning a lot of things that I thought I knew, but I didn't really know. And it was kind of just... Finding out like what was what was maybe Mormon doctrine versus like what's right. actually in the scriptures. Mm. Um, but anyway, so so, oh. so go back to what you're so saying. So for me, when I first joined the church, they put you in gospel essentials class, and it's like with a couple missionaries and a couple like long lifers, like a couple young lifers. So depending on like I I think that they kind of plant people in the class because I was planted into a gospel essentials class with someone that had just joined the class. They said, oh, you should go to gospel essentials. There's someone your age you would get along with. Um, So I went to gospel essentials as a new member, a new convert, and they're going through the Bible. Um, It's kind of like a, I, it's a 12 week or it's like a 12 month um, series. So at this point, yeah, at this point they're going through the book of Mormon um, and I'm asking them why is the Book of Mormons stating that the the fruits of the priesthood, they are the fruits of the gospel. And that, oh, isn't that so great that God would give us um, like these these crossover revelations. Like where in the Bible, it may say it's the fruits of the spirit, but in, in our like doctrines and covenants in the Book of Mormon, it's the fruits of the priesthood. Okay. And so I'm calling out like these plagiarisms, but they're confirming them back to me as like, like, signs of great revelation. Right. Yeah. And there's a couple other verses that happened to me. And that's really where I read the CES letter. The first or second one is all the proofs where not only where were uh, the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenant, some things were some revelations were plagiarized. The inconsistencies and incorrect grammar in the original KJV that Joseph Smith used to plagiarize were also plagiarized. Wow. So misspellings, um, commas in the wrong place. He also plagiarized. Left them there. Yeah. Wow. And that right there, I that I stopped reading right then. So what what so. got you guys to read the CES? You, you've got to start the story off. Okay, so he came to Georgia and and we're so we had to act, actually asked a bit. We were called. That's what they call you. We were called. Right. The bishop called us to be mm-hmm. our son's Sunday school teacher. You know, that's so divine. Yeah. That our son needed a Sunday school teacher. We just so happened to be available to be open, you know, the calling. And <laughs> yeah, so we had to do ex- with the fact that the people that were there were not doing their job or showing up or anything. Yeah. So we accepted <laughs> this calling on the sidelines. Um, and then that Thursday he had an appointment at the, like uh, the, basically the unemployment office for job fair. Yeah, it was a V it was a VA sponsored job fair for. Yeah. So he's at the job fair and I'm in the car for like two hours and at this time, I'm just sitting on Reddit, scrolling on Reddit, mm. and I'm pretty good at spot a Mormon. Like Mormons have physical features, um, especially if they're like families of Mormons or what? Sorry. Anyway, your game spot a Mormon. She's like, really good. No, there's there's little physical features that <laughs> right. they have that I'm pretty good. So well, I'm scrolling. They're super big into families, so yes, and they have huge families, so yeah. they're all gonna look alike. Um, so I'm scrolling Reddit and this I stop on this post. And I'm like, oh, that's a Mormon woman and her kids. And I read it and it said, thanks to it was like the Apologia, like uh, thanks to Apologia and the CES letter. And I went back to search on Reddit because I had saved the post. It's gone. So I think she deleted her Reddit because I was going to bring it. And I tried to show it to Jerry like forever ago. Uh, this was in two, September 2017. Yep. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I'd been, I'd been. So you guys had. It'd been Jeff like a month or two since I got Just started putting out content. Like this was the first one. It was like gospel for Mormons or yeah. something like that. It was like the first video, and it was like thanks to Apologia and the CES letter, I have saved my family from the Mormon Church. Wow. And I'm like, oh, I go to comment, and I'm like, let me tell you how bad of a mom you are, and like that's. You're angry. Oh, I was mad, and so, um. I go to comment that, and and like I said, I've searched Reddit archives. I've searched everything. I like a lot of things on Reddit. I'm Reddit purveyor and um, of good books, and I could not find it. So I've searched forever. Reddit posts. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> um, I open it up, and the first comment says, if you're coming here to tell this woman how bad of a mom she is, you need to read the CES letter. Wow. And I'm like, oh, who are you to tell me that I can't tell this woman that she's a bad mother? What is this CES letter? So there it goes. The link was there. I open it up and I start reading it. 
And at this time, I was going to school for to be a geologist. So things like plagiarism and and like real fact were very important to me. Right. Like super important. So to see the first or second thing in the CES letter be about plagiarism, I was done. Like that right there, like, no, we don't play with plagiarism at all. And um, I kept reading until he came out and he comes and sits in the car and literally, I'm like, oh, how'd it go? And he's like, oh, great. And so I said, hey. <laughs> That's um, how I talk sometimes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have a question for you. And he's like, what? And I was like, do you think the church is true? And he goes. My brain was just like, duh. <laughs> uh. And he goes, um, are you going to divorce me if I tell you the answer? Wow. Yeah, no, and, that's what I said. And I said, well, now I know the answer. But no, I'm not going to divorce you. Do you think the church is true? And he goes, no. Wow, quickly too, huh? Just, that was that was the first time I think I had been honest with her in three years. Instantly, our relationship was amazing. Yep. Instantly. Wow. Instantly. Like, it was like we were holding hands on the way home. We had not hold ha- held hands in years. Wow. Like, that night, we went, to- we went home immediately, and I told him, I found this thing. I want you to read it on the way home. We were like 30 minutes from the house. Um, we printed it out and print, printed two copies and sat there and we read till about, like I said, three quarters of it done. We were opening footnotes. We had the digital one up, clicking footnotes, opening everything, looking at everything. Um, and it was just appalling, the evidence. that. And not only was the evidence, it wasn't even on websites. like out, It wasn't people's opinions. It wasn't on blogs. It was on right. the LDS.org website. Yep. And that was what got me like, like I said, the plagiarism thing, we're done. I'm already done. You've already proven to me, but I'm going to keep going because I got to make sure that like we're nailed. So not that, um, that was a Thursday and we were supposed to go to church on Sunday to accept the the public calling where everyone like eyes us into church, like to be our son. They, Sunday they, school. Uh, they vote, yeah. you know what I mean? But yeah. no one ever, no one ever no. denies you yeah. to be. Uh, uh, no. I know for, for me reading through that stuff, it was kind of weird because I, I, I knew a lot of it, I think, but not to the degree and the specificity that it was. It was so it's so it was good laid out in the CES letter, and um, so reading it there and seeing like all of the evidence and everything, it was like they had powerpoints. Like yeah. this guy had powerpoints from BYU, like PhD, like people who'd done it as like their doctoral thesis to graduate from BYU, but it was like their shelf break. So like you could click on this thing and it was like someone who was like going to get their doctorates and they had done this PowerPoint for their thesis and you're reading through it like, but they didn't get it. I just had a really weird memory pop up. Right. I remember being brought into church one time and having like a special like whatever. They had this guy come and basically tried to like convince us on the archaeological evidence. Oh, okay. Um, and they also talked to us about the... Uh, how is it? Is it iamic pentameter? I think that's what they call it. Hmm. The way that, like, one of the way they proof text that they try to proof text the Book of Mormon. Um, basically, like, yeah. So they brought this guy in, and he was like a professor from BYU or something like that. This is like when I was a teenager, I think. Um, anyway, so so this is this is not like this kind of stuff is yeah. things they do as you're growing up. You know, they kind of present these um, arguments in a sense. Yeah, essentially. Um, yeah, so. So we were reading through it, and we were supposed to be teachers and be confirmed as Sunday school teachers that Sunday. Four days later. I literally waited until church had started. I was like, and hey, you I text, text the, bishop? the bishop. I said, <laughs> yeah. I said uh, we will not be accepting the calling as teachers. We are not coming back. Don't, During church service. Don't contact us. <laughs> wow. So then we publicly left the church. We tried. We took a couple families with us out of church, out of that ward. Uh, we submitted our resignation to quit Mormon on Thursday because yep. it was all attached to the CES letter website. Um, once we got into that community, immediately that evening, we found out how to submit on quit Mormon. So Thursday, we submitted our quit Mormon. Sunday, we text our bishop thinking he probably didn't have it yet. <laughs> he probably did. Um, right after that, about that Sunday, well, we so made, Sunday we, we went to on church. Facebook too, I think, also. Yeah, well, you did because no one to this day. And my family knows that I was LDS. Wow. I had a lot of LDS people um, that I was friends with on Facebook, though. I just, But I want to, like... Yeah, go ahead. My mom and my dad and my nana and 
Well, my papa, rest in peace. Uh, no one knows that I was LDS. She actually yelled at me one time because I had accidentally left out a Book of Mormon when and they came parents, to visit one time. My parents oh, found it. Oh. And we had to. I had to lie. Yeah. So my parents would come into town and we she would said, take off. Who did you tell them? Some Mormon missioners came by came and left by and it. Came and gave yeah. it to us. Oh, man. And so I would take down all the artwork. And so, and so if they listen to this, this would be the first time they hear that you were once yeah. a Mormon. Love you, Mom. <laughs> wow. So so okay. But, so you hear, you read the CES letter. I had a letter. whole secret life, but yeah. Let me let me just t- like I want to touch on that. Like that is the Mormon life. You have secret lives, and they're all in Venn diagrams mm. as to who is allowed in to each little circle, right, like each right. little oval slice. Mm-hmm. And like you have your secret life that's your secret sin because every Mormon has secret sin that they hide from their spouse, they hide from themselves. Wow. That they don't want to admit to, um, they like whatever it is. Wow! So in this mine Ven- was like at that time a shopping addiction. I didn't know that I had. So so in this Venn diagram, there's no section where every circle interlaps with someone being in there. The there, no one really knows. The only one is that you are the creator of all these other little circles. Yeah. So there's no yeah. one that actually has that intimacy. Yeah. No. In your life, knowing anything. Nope. Mm, imagine a Venn diagram where not none of them all interlap. Yeah, maybe like one or two. Like, I think like when he shared with me about his addiction, it kind of like a little, but like a little little sliver. Right. right. But like that is. I mean, she was, she was telling stuff. She would tell her friends more about our marriage than she would tell me. But that was the culture. Yeah. You know what I mean? So she would, she would be like, oh, he did the, they would, she would like complain. But I never told them about a lot of stuff. But yeah. Yeah. But I mean, she would, I remember her telling me after the fact that they were trying to encourage her to like leave me. Mm. And like these were things, uh, the things that that she had told them about, I didn't even know. Right, because like, oh, she wow. never talked to me about it. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. We never had that kind of communication, and so, um, and I. Didn't but even same for them to me. The same the for them to me. Right, and I, and I found myself actually burdening their experiences and bringing them home and living them out to my husband. Oh wow! Yeah, I mean that's that's what happens in the form of idolatry. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know that's what it is. You're not looking to the right spot for the answer. So instead of consulting with your husband and and trying to work things out with Jesus as the foundation, you go to other people. Like mm-hmm. we're yeah. we're like like Calvin says, you know we. Our heart's an idol factor, and we're ne- idol factory, and we're never idle in making idols. Yeah. yeah, and we never find the answers we're looking for when we're doing that. Humans make bad gods. We try to worship everyone else, even ourselves, and we always fail ourselves. So, so you guys find the CS letter. How how do you come to biblical Christianity, though? Oh, okay, so that I'm that like, actually- <laughs> oh my gosh. So because I, uh, God never gave up on me. And let me and tell my you, my wife never gave up on me. If I could Aww. write Christian music, Praise that would God be like my wife, the album would be God never gave up on me, and it would be like that bad <laughs> worship leader, <laughs> the bad worship leader who just repeats the chorus ever over and over again. Right. It would, would be like be God never gave up on me, <laughs> yeah. God's sovereignty, God's sovereignty, like over and over again, and that would yeah. be the entire one hour album. Um, <laughs> but like, so we left, and I was like, Coming we're going to Christmas. church. Yeah, coming out of that album, yeah. coming out this, coming Christmas. Out this Christmas. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> wow, okay, um, okay. So, so you guys come out and you say you're going to church. How yeah, do you know we went where to, to go? Okay, so I grew up Episcopal. Well, real quick. And I was ready. Like, as soon as we were, like, done with Mormonism, like, yep. Uh, on Thursday. Sundays are free again, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thursday, That's man. Funny. He's like, I'm done. I'm yeah, I was done. like, hey, what do you want to do, wanna do Thursday? You want to go to a bar? Or like, that's kind of how, like, that was my mentality. You know what I mean? Like, let's go do stuff we never, we haven't been able to do. Yeah. You know? Yep. Um, so Sunday morning, she's like, "Nope, we're going to church." We were at an Episcopal church. That was a weird with experience with a gay pastor, or gay uh, bishop. Oh my goodness, it was a very weird experience for me. Yeah. I, so I grew up, you know, going to the Episcopal yeah. church back in its like old days before it became progressive. So to go to the Episcopal church and see what it was now um, was a little shocking. Yeah. Um, it kind of took me back a little bit, but then it was kind of like weird because that guy went to the same Episcopal church I did as a kid. The liturgy was very like, strange too. <laughs> wow. Like, yeah. In you know, Arkansas. Here, here he went was, to the, in Arkansas. He went to the same church. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah, no, that was that was really odd. So we like had like memories, like this bishop. Like yeah. it was really yeah. That is wild. Yeah, yeah, she's sitting there and I'm like, this is super weird. She's like, No, it's fine, it's fine. You this know, this is like, great. And it's all old people. Yeah, this Episcopal it was, church. It was, just it's great. Great. It was like, so homely, like homey gr- growing to me. Up, it, well, to me it also felt <laughs> it felt too um Mormon. Yeah, not well. It didn't feel Mormon. It felt too much like Mormonism in in the 
the ritual kind right. of the pomp and flow. circumstance. Yeah, so because you know he comes out in his robes, he's got the <laughs> the bowl or whatever he was holding. The liturgy. Yeah, the lit- like I said, the liturgy was weird, and and. For me, I was like, this is so creepy, weird. I don't like this. You know what I mean? It was, and, a, it was a very bad introduction into very, very Anglican, like, re, like old school church. To, or right. like To go right yeah. after Mormonism, seven days after leaving the Mormon church into an Episcopal with service. A, with a gay with pastor. With a gay pastor. And I tell you what, she <laughs> had, yeah. she had like five churches lined up. And after like, we went to the Episcopal church, I was like, I don't know if I oh, can I do had this. Like, I was like, okay, Episcopal church gets done at noon. I found this one that goes at one. And I was like, and then there's one at six. And then there was one I at nine. Her, I was like, and, I don't think I could do yeah, this. I, I don't. Like, I don't think I could do so, this. So, so did you know there was a difference essentially between like Orthodox Christianity and in Mormonism, or did you think that you're just going to a different church I had that talked about Jesus? I realized that Mormonism was a cult, but I didn't know that it was something different until 6 p.m. that night. Okay, so tell me about the 6 p.m. that night. Okay, talk about your shirt. Oh this yeah, is okay. You. So this is me. This is me. All right. So <laughs> okay. this is me. My son, during this whole time, had been going to a karate studio. Um, and I had developed like a friendly relationship with the owner. Um, and uh, she had become pretty good friends with the receptionist there. And so I don't even remember when did she invite you to church. It had been I texted her that, that day right? and I was like, hey, girl, what church you go to? Oh, okay. There you go. She's and like, she, I go to church at karate studio. And I'm yeah. like, you go to karate church? What? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what we call it, karate church. Yeah. Um, it's not like that anymore. But right. they had basically, they had uh, planted a church in um, Pooler, Georgia. And at the time, they didn't have a church building or really like a huge um, congregation. So they just met at the at the karate studio. At the yeah. dojo. So it was like, okay, this is kind of interesting. So we went and, um, you know, of course for me, it was still kind of like, oh, I don't want to go here. You know, um, kind of typical, I guess, for, for my experience up at that point. But um, I met the pastor. We, you know, they did a little bit of worship. Met, you know, pastor gave like a pretty short, it was like a devotional. It wasn't really like a full sermon. Right. Uh, and then he was like, all right, everybody break out to your groups. And we're like, what? Groups? What's mm-hmm. that? Yeah, what's that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh then um, my friend Carson was like, hey, man, you're coming with me. I'm like, okay. So we sit down. And there's a group. It's probably like, I don't know, 10 men. We're all sitting in a circle. And Carson car- starts talking about how he just got back from Trace Diaz, which is a uh, like a men's retreat that they do in Georgia. Okay. Um, and it's kind of unique in that you can only go as a participant once. You go once. You get... Um, basically you have to be sponsored by someone who's already been there. You go the one time and then you can go back again, but you have to serve. That's oh, kind of the deal. Okay, okay. So the first time you go, you just go to experience it. Um, and while you're there, uh, your friends and family write you letters, um, talking about your walk with Christ and, you know, different things, whatever. But he reads this letter his, his sister sent him while he was gone. And the dude starts crying. I'd never seen that before. Yeah. Ever. Here, here, this grown man, you know, about the same age as me, we're in our 30s, and he's crying, describing, like reading this letter and then talking about his experience with Christ at this men's retreat. Hmm. And that was the very first time I'd ever met like real Christian men before who actually knew how to show the love of Christ to others. Wow, like that vulnerability? Yeah. It was crazy. And from that moment on, I'm like, I want to find out more about this. This is something I want to I want to find out about. So I started going to their small group uh, that met every week, and, and uh, we started going to their church. And um, eventually they moved to a school, so we started going to the school. You were baptized before that. Was I? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's right, because I had to go to their main building. All right, so their main campus. Yeah, we campus, drove like an hour away. Their main campus was in Statesboro. Statesboro. And uh, so, yeah, I forgot about that. So so I'd been going to their thing, and I had a lot of questions. Um, they actually. I like cornered him with the pastor. <laughs> and I was like, it's time, dude. And he was like, well, well, my Mormon baptism is good. I don't know why I have to get baptized again. I'm like, is your salvation? And I don't know why after, and well, I'll, actually I'll touch pa- on why everything was, clicked for the me. The pastor was like, oh no, you got to get rebaptized, man. You got to get saved. He's like, you got to get saved. And he's like, my salvation's good. I don't understand why I have to get saved. And we're like in the parking lot, 
like cornering him. Well, hold on a second. Like, hold on. Yeah, before that even before that even happened. Yeah. I'm going to their I'm going to the small groups. I actually got they're like, "Hey, we need, you know, like everyone should be discipled. Everybody should be discipled." I'm like, "What's that?" Like, "Oh, you don't have anybody to disciple you? Here you go. Here's this guy." So then we started meeting one on one. Bless John, by yeah, the way. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Thank you, John. <laughs> uh, we started meeting and um, so we started doing one on one on one intentional discipleship. And John, the guy who discipled me, was actually discipled by the pastor there, uh, Michael, great guy, both really great guys. And um, and so we're kind of going through the same stuff. And me, man, I, I really had a hard time at first because we're going through stuff, we're talking about things, and I'm like, I just have all these questions, right? I'm like, what's this Trinity business all about? You know what I mean? Like, that yeah. can't be real. You it's know like what I mean? Council of Nicaea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know about this. <laughs> I didn't know anything about that, man. <laughs> My prophet said that's wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, no, nah, no. Nah. You know, so yeah. so I'm getting all defensive about that. And then I I remember I just I remember specifically telling her numerous times, like, like, I don't think I can keep doing this, you know. And I remember having not fights, but I was very like aggressive with him at certain times because I was challenged. Con- I was confronting my own indoctrination. Right. You know, and like I remember talking to him, I literally described to him the entire pre existence story of Mormonism. You're like, yeah, it's in the Bible, right? And he's like, no, that's that's not in the Bible. I'm like, yeah, it is. It's it. He's like, no, uh-uh. And I was like, oh, well, that's that's not good. Yeah. So, you know, we start looking into stuff and, you know, it went- At this time, I didn't know this was happening because he would be like, I'm not going to discipleship. I'm rescheduling. I'm like, oh no, you're going. Like, <laughs> yeah, I had a really hard time. I was like, you're leaving. I really, like, I really did <laughs> yeah. struggle. Um, going to discipleship and sometimes even a small group, I was like, I, I can't do this. I'm not, you know what I mean? It was, yeah. it was really difficult, uh, to continue. And, you know, fortunately my wife is Southern stubborn enough to <laughs> <laughs> keep pushing. I was it. like, yeah. get up out this house, boy. Yeah. Yeah. Like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't um, eating dinner till you're done. So, <laughs> <laughs> so then, uh, but, but after a certain point, it was like things, fl- things clicked for me. And I, and I was like, you know, um, so I, I sat down with the pastor one day. His his office was a coffee shop right by my house. Um, best coffee shop ever, for real. Um, but he didn't have a building, so that's where he would go and just do sermon prep and everything. And I could walk there from my house. And so one day I just went over there and I was like, hey, man. So we started talking and she talked to him about a couple things. And then uh, that was when she was like, you know. I was like, oh yeah, by the way, he's not baptized or saved. And he thinks that his Mormon salvation is suffi- like sufficient. She called me now, out, Now, at this time, <laughs> in the back of my head, I'm thinking that my baptism at 10 was sufficient. And mm. that my entire life up to this point was just by chance. So I thought that I was fine. And I'm just throwing my husband under the bus like I had done my whole life. So do you want me to talk about how I knew that I Mormonism was Go, I mean, go like ahead, yeah. False, and then we'll catch up. Sure, yeah. Okay, so Sorry. I sit down in my group, and the women are doing a study of First Timothy, right? And so they start, I pulled it up on my Bible, my trusty Bible. They start reading, uh, now that we know that the law, now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mo- mothers. And they continue in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God for which I have been entrusted. So they're talking about false teachers, right? In first Timothy and it, it just clicks. And I said, you know, like, I don't know. What do you mean about like false teachers? Um, and I said, I actually just left the Mormon church this morning. Mm. And they're like, what? And <laughs> they all just start flipping to Titus and second Timothy, and they're like giving me the qualifications for elders and deacons and like completely deconstructing like the bishop pastor right. term. Like you can't just be assigned this. Like it is like a biblical role, um, which is why I struggle with uh, the term elder right. being assigned to like a 18 year old boy yeah. in the Mormon church. Um, and really just, just laying into me like the foundational truths of like where a the church leadership comes from. Right. Not even that's an stu- interesting angle. Yeah. Very interesting. I never heard anyone go about that angle. Yeah, not even because that's where my question came from. And, oh, okay. and so from there, my uh my question to them was, so you guys can go shopping on Sunday? So they're lay- they're laying out the fine <laughs> like how, you know, we get everything comes from Jesus. Like pastors, they're, you know, they're ordained of Jesus. They're not just 
like dreamed about or chosen, you know, by their friend, you or know, voted like, for by voted a group for. Of people. Like they're they're right. literally just like laying this out for me. And my my response was, So you guys go shopping on Sunday? They're like, Yeah, girl, where do you when do you think I go? Like I'm like, I don't know, Thursday? I just like <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Thursday. Saturday. <laughs> just yeah. Um <laughs> and so that like right then immediately I thought that everything I had just done for the past four years was just eh, whatever and back just I'm going to erase it straight up out of my salvation story just bloop gone back to being baptized at 10 I'm fine I'm saved Mm, okay you know and I remember them asking me are you saved and I was like yeah I'm saved I was actually baptized at 10 and and I'm so grateful for the pastor now and I really think that because of our experience and him discussing Mormonism with us his his flock will never falter mm-hmm. and let a Mormon person ever leave unsaved. They like ever leave their group unsaved again. But they got me good. <laughs> so <laughs> he gets saved. And then uh come like February, I'm sitting in church and God is just like, You need salvation, you need salvation, you need salvation, you need and I look to my friend and, and our that church actually does not like an altar call, but the pastor's like it's such a small congregation at that point, like mm-hmm maybe 60 70 people if that yeah maybe they're in the, they're in the school people, at this point like maybe 50 40 50 people and he's you know it's really interpersonal relationship at that point it's still like a big life group so right. their their and, their main growth like plan i guess for their church is is through those small groups cuz the life groups yeah yeah Connect so ba- groups. yeah they yeah the different names for them i think yeah. you guys what do you guys yeah, call reach them? groups, reach groups. Yeah. yeah same kind of deal so you have like your group and then once you reach about 12 people you kind of multiply. They call yeah, multiply, you invite people split, to church but, by inviting them to your connect group. Yeah, and that's kind of how their the majority of their ministry happens. Everybody that leads um, one of those groups is actually like called by the by the pastor, mm-hmm. um, you know, and kind of discipled to make sure that they are you know doing. They, yeah, and they go out there and right. evangelize and stuff. Yeah, and get people to great. come to the connect group. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, exactly. so I'm sitting there with my connect group leader and the girl that was the. Uh, she never left my side, Stacy, and like she n- still. Uh, she was actually the receptionist at the karate studio, the front desk worker. And I'm looking at her and I, he said, you know, like I said, it's so intimate at that moment that he could literally say, is there anyone here that wants to pray for salvation? Like our, like there's a couple people wait, waiting to pray for you. And um, I'm looking at her and it was like Super Bowl Sunday because you were not there. You were with her husband. Yeah. So I was I yeah. was friends with her husband, but her husband worked like a weird uh, I think he worked night shift, so I never saw him. And like he would come to our group like every so often. It was very, very rare that he would actually be able to come. And so he was like, "Hey, I'm off for Super Bowl. You like, you want to come to the house and hang out?" And I was like, "Man, I should go to church, but I'm gonna go <laughs> hang out with this guy because I don't ever get to see yeah. him." Right. So and- I'm looking at her, and she's looking at me, kind of like, "What are you like?" <laughs> and I'm like, "I don't know. Like, should I say something?" And she's kind of like looking at me. She's like. Like, are you saved? And I'm like, I think so. And she's like, that's not the answer. <laughs> like, like, you know, and she's like, if you she like grabs me and I'm like, uh, like shaking and almost in tears, like basically like all my conventions are going down, like everything, my cognitive dissonance left from my previous cultural. Now we're breaking down cultural Christianity. Right. Where I thought I was saved. Right, you know, right, right. so we've skipped over the Mormonism. We're jumping straight to my childhood. Yeah. And she's like, if you walk out of this building right now and get hit by a bus, where are you going? Mm. Girl, you got it. Like that's I have always used that evangelism line when it comes down to like hot pressed evangelism yeah. with people. No, it's real. And I and I'm like, I don't know. And she's like, I think, you know, the answer. Pastor's already done with this. He's already done like we're over the, wasn't he's about the, to dismiss the, everybody. Say, wasn't the song, like the closing song yeah, being played? Yeah, and I like straight up and just like, me. And he turns around and he's like, what? Like literally, and he's like, I think we have somebody. And I just like lost it. I'm like in tears and mm. like uh, Kelly, one of my really good friends, Kelly and Meredith came and they were like holding me and just like, they took me out to the hall because I couldn't even like take it anymore. It was like everything that I had like held on to like that was my conversion. Like, so to think that all these moments that I'd had in my life where I thought that I had been saved, like that was it. And right. like, they're like, why are you crying? This is not a sad time. Christ took my burden just now. Well, yeah, that's what I said. I was like, I, 
I said, I feel like free. Like that's yeah. what I told them. I you said, I feel, burden. I feel free now, you mm-hmm. know? And they're like, so these are happy. Like they're like, so these are happy. T- these are my friends, yeah. you know? So they're, they're crying for a happy reason. I'm like, yeah. yes. <laughs> wow. And they're like, okay. And they just held me for like an hour. Yeah. And that's like, real right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I te- I ended up texting him like, too bad you weren't here. <laughs> too bad yeah, you weren't here. I got did. saved without you. <laughs> yeah. I heard and about I got- it later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And this I is got- why you don't miss church for yeah. the super bowl <laughs> dude that's funny people get saved on the super bowl <laughs> yeah and i got baptized on easter <laughs> super saved sunday yeah, yeah right super saved sunday i got right. baptized on baptized easter Baptized on easter yeah. beautiful and the freezing cold water it was just like, like I was so it was that. so crazy to like shake mormonism and think that i was fine yeah and still think that i was fine and saved and god being like no you're not this is i'm calling you now wow. like yeah, I, I think a lot of people go through that because we had a couple friend, um, a couple's, we were friends with a couple, that's the best way to say it, uh, <laughs> we had a who, friend. yeah, we had a couple friends, uh, who, who also left Mormonism. Mm. That we took, um, this is when we took them with them after we started getting stalked by the missionaries. Is this yeah. what you're talking about? The couple we took with us? No. So the missionaries started Mm-mm. stalking us? No. I oh. mean, this is when we went back to Las Vegas. Oh. Uh, anyway, I'm out of I'm out of order here, but I'm just saying that the the idea that your baptism still holds holds water, no pun intended, um, mm-hmm. when you're Mormon it is very real. Like people think that that is like when you, even when you leave Mormon, I'm like, oh, I'm good, yeah, right. Uh, and I mean, like I said, I went through it. She went through it. Um, you know, and even we, like I said, we met. We had a there was a a couple friend of ours who from our Christian church from our Christian church who kind of felt the same way about who it. Who still and, feel like they're and we we you know I tried to explain to them kind of that that's not the case at all. Um, your baptism doesn't save you. No, it especially doesn't. Your or your Mormon salvation in, in, yeah. to Mormonism into a different gospel. This right, mm-hmm. definitely does not save you. Yeah. So, um, so once we left, like I got back. Honestly, I was. Man, I was so excited. Like w- after I got baptized, I felt weird because I was in front of everybody. Um, but like my son ran up and hugged me. I was oh, like was trying amazing. not to cry the whole time. Like it was, it was crazy. Um, anyway, Our son oh, was I also like want to go worst. back. So this is this Our- is the their their shirts they sell at the. Uh, so he he's moved studios. He's got like a whole new karate studio. We went back we went to back visit to go them. See it, yeah. And he's like, hey man, here's some shirts, right? And so I I wear this all the time. But it's it's their their shirt they sell at the karate studio. Where where the church got started? Wow, you know, man, I feel like Pastor Jeff needs to meet that guy. Yeah, oh, they oh, would I'm be sure. they yeah. would be they, best friends would, yeah. instantly. Yeah. They're like kind of very similar people. Yeah, yeah, uh, and um, and now the their church has grown so much they have like a dedicated building. Like an actual building. They've actually they actually moved from Pooler to Savannah and they've because they wanted to be a new more. Church. Yeah, wow. it's it's they've been yeah. growing like multiplied. crazy. Yep. Yeah, multiply. Yeah, there not split. <laughs> yeah. I'm just using the lingo. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, I mean, people say split. It's kind of like a negative. Yeah. I knew it. I'm yeah. totally knew it. Yeah. Uh, so, so it's been just great. Like not only seeing their church grow, right. But also knowing that like we, that God put us in Georgia oh, in a place where we could be with strong Christians, with strong Christians, where we could be surrounded and and not have to go through those same problems that I've seen friends of mine and other people where you leave the church and you become an atheist or or whatever. That's the problem with the, like the CES letter is is great in a sense where people can come to know that the the Mormon church isn't true, but however. But then what's what's after that? Exactly. From out of the frying pan and into the fire, you Mm -hmm. know, you actually had, there was a faith-based system around you, biblical Christianity, Christians, you went to the right church god ordained that specific time ordained your past there's no other way that, they, that it could happen yeah. exactly we were already like kind of broke so like connor going to karate was really difficult but like that was one thing we were never going to give up like was karate and mm. we were never going to stop paying for our son to go to karate so we kept that relationship months after we shouldn't have and and like it was just like weird we were always able to afford karate for our son and it was just like when you look back at like all the time. This is before we got saved even too. Yeah. Before like, we yeah, went yeah, there yeah, to yeah. church. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, before we went there to church. And so like, all the time that God like placed people in our lives intentionally and all the times he didn't place people in our lives. Because had we moved to Georgia and the church been the what it should have been or whatever you want to call the LDS church should have been LDS church standards. Finding the CES letter would have chased me back to church for questions. The okay. LDS church. Um, or had we still been in Las Vegas like 
And, and it's so, I love that the Bible even reiterates, like, you know, people use it as like a cliche, like, oh, you have seasons of your life. People come and go in seasons. That's biblical. Like, God places people in your life and takes them out of your life when you when he's done with them being there. Mm-hmm. That boss, the second we moved there, I lost that job. Mm. And we were in Georgia. Like, it instant. Yeah, we, we felt she stuck moved, there. She moved me to Georgia, and I lost, and, the, and she kind of was done with that business. So I was stuck in Georgia. And so right. he so he moved and got a job and then his job brought him his new job then brought him back to Las Vegas where now we were hated hated so yeah, the, I had when we left the church I was, like I said I was kind of public about it um but not I even had, that we had not that you weren't that public you made I mean, like I put, one I, I made a Facebook post and you posted which your is public. baptism yeah yeah yeah, and the, yeah but I got calls from people that within I, a day it was within a day of the quit mormon someone post. told me i thought you were i thought i always thought you were a good person i thought you were a good a good father Why so would people you leave the from church? las vegas were like calling and harassing us before we had even made an announcement so the quit mormon for whatever reason the church must have thought we were still in vegas and it assigned it to vegas and so we were getting calls from people within 24 hours of us submitting that by friday and saturday um, from people in Vegas asking us why we were leaving the church. I thought you were good people, mm. thought you were a good father. Um, and then we took a couple families after we started going to that Christian church, Connection Church. Uh, we convinced a couple people to stop going to the Mormon church. Now they're, I don't believe that they're any Christian church because we were very cage stage. We didn't right. know how to disciple them into a Christian church. Um, and I pray that God is with them every day. Um, but we had LDS missionaries like outside our house at like 11 o'clock at night watching our house to see like who was at our house or like what we were doing. What in the world? Yeah, yeah it was weird. It was really weird. It was very strange. They'd like, we'd look and they'd be behind us or like, you know, it was, yeah. That's very odd. It was yeah. almost like some Scientology stuff. So, yeah, they're, uh, speaking they're, of Scientology, yeah. <laughs> so the way, I, so, okay, up to finding the CES letter, was it up to or right after? So Leah Remini Scientology. I think, it, I think we saw it concurrently right after. Almost. Yeah, it was about the so, same time. So at the time I'm in this MLM or had just left MLM, I just lost the job that uh, was kind of attached to that MLM. Um, the Scientology show comes out and I'm equating everything in the Scientology show to what that MLM had to do. Like, wow, this is just like the MLM I was in. These are the same things that they made us do. Wow. So like I'm watching the Scientology show. We find the CES letter. And I remember watching the show right after finding the CES letter Mm. and it clicking. This is just like Mormonism. Not as it just forget that it's just like the MLM. This is just like the LDS church. Everything she's saying, like what, not the little electric test, but the the brainwashing and the indoctrination and the the fear the tactics. fear tactics like having your friends follow you the the missionaries following us after that like the missionaries being outside her house and then that being on her episode about the church members taking pictures of them while they were right. walking around yeah that was literally like i broke down i would think i was like laying on the ground in our house like in a ball crying wow oh yeah like i I told him I need cult I need cult therapy. And after that I ended up reading um finding a bunch of articles online like how to handle leaving a cult. So I kind of did like self therapy along with um biblical stuff like with th- my pastor I think discipleship with my helped a lot. my discipleship yeah. and with my small group. But um and I'm grateful I didn't go it's find amazing, a it's cult amazing therapist what cuz they probably would have took me out of Christianity. God's word right. of truth will do, you know. So yeah. yeah. So yeah. grateful I had the Bible, my small group and those those resources online. However, I wish there were more. Did you just leave a cult <laughs> Christian resource? You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's very very true. That's one thing Jerry and I talk about a lot. Like you can watch Leah Remini, Scientology in the Aftermath, or you can do Steve Asan combating cult mind control. They have these standards that they appeal to with no actual real answers into why those standards even matter in the first place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Christians should be the ones that actually are standing on the word of God very vocally about these things. And it's J.K. Van Balen who stated that the cults are the unpaid debts of the church. And that's a very real thing that we're facing today in our society. And we can see what happens when the church is inactive in a in a nation. I mean, America is facing it with the judgment that we see all around us. Um, It's it's also, I would say, is the, the unpaid debt of the church. You know, it's time to to rise up and preach the gospel and truly believe that Christ is king and that he reigns over every realm that we that we can that we can see he's over every government it says that he's over every every rule and authority he 
is master of it. And that's our king. And we're citizens of that holy nation. And it's our duty as Christians to go preach the gospel, which is the freeing truth of salvation. Uh, I mean, that's the only way we can live in a peaceful world, a peaceful society is actually people being dead to sin and free to Christ to actually know what it even means to be human again. Yeah. Yeah, like amen. we're lost. We're lost, you so know, we, without that. There was a point where we started to feel lost and complacent in our Christian church. Um, and I'll self-admit that we started to equate a lot of the service, you know, with setting up a church or setting up a school for church to some of the same service we felt in the Mormon church. It was still mm -hmm. very fresh and new to us. Um, so God decided that we were moving back to Vegas. Mm. I, I do. Yeah. Before we get into that, and, I do want to say oh, one thing. Like okay. when, when I, you know, when I got saved, I remember turning to my pastor who was with me and my wife was with me too, but and asking him, okay, what now? And he goes, well, now the real work begins, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. And and I think that that is also something that's RC really important sprawl. and really missing, really missing uh, from a lot of evangelical churches today is that they look at that moment of salvation as, as the peak, as like the peak of your Christian experience, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Whereas where the real joy comes in that justification or that sanctification, sanctification process, yeah. and and where you really get to know Christ. Wow. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and I've we've been to a number of different churches um and yeah. I could say that that's that's pretty accurate. So so what what you're saying which is really powerful to me is that because you have peace with God you can now enjoy sanctification. And sanctification is not necessarily painful. something that it's is very painful. That, that you enjoy, right? Yeah. Like no, that's yeah. the thing like well well they're suffering <laughs> For the sake of Christ and being disciplined by a holy God, which is loving. Mm -hmm. And in that suffering, the Christian knows it's only because he has peace with God that he experiencing the loving discipline hand of God. So, so you can have joy throughout it in terms of your sanctification. Like you said, that shouldn't be our peak. Is this the moment of our salvation? That is an amazing, beautiful moment of our lives. Of course, the Holy Spirit taking a heart of stone, replacing with a heart of flesh. But now he who started a good work in us will not leave us. He will complete it. The Bible mm -hmm. promises us that. So we have joy as Christians in suffering where if you go to anyone else who is suffering, it's not suffering under the discipline of God. It's suffering under the wrath of God. And that's a hopeless suffering. Right. And that's where we, I think, as you're talking about the evangelical church at large, may very well suffer from the fact where they don't want their people to suffer the discipline of mm -hmm. God. Yeah. They want you to focus on one peak instead of actually continuing your walk with the Lord and putting those sins to death, which can be very painful. But, but, but the truth is, is that suffering in the Bible, suffering with God, try to find one text in the New Testament that says it's a bad thing. Yeah. It yeah, does you not. You won't find one. <laughs> you will not find one. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing because it's love. Well, for AJ, I mean, I hope you don't mind, but like when he was baptized, he was still dealing with his addiction. Right. And I remember you asking me like even a year into it, like why would God save me and still have me deal with this? In spite of your sin? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and I think that um, in fact, our, <laughs> when we kind of transitioned to uh, our kind of understanding of Reformed theology, I think that's really where, for me, that was really where I, I kind of, I, I don't really cry from books a lot, um, but I was reading this book that was, it's called uh, Humble, Humble Calvinism, Calvinism by J. Metters. Yeah, and, and he was talking about, uh, uh, I think it was Irresistible Grace, and, um, and I'm like, it just, it really hit me, you know? Like that I'm this wretched thing and that God would actually choose to save me for myself. Amen. You know, and, and I'm even getting it a little bit now, but it's like the weight of that. I don't know that you, you can never pay that back. Right. That's that's you can't do anything to make up for that. And other than just be thankful and, and worship. Amen. You know, Amen. and that worship is what gets you through it is what conquers those things. That's right. That's right. Guys, yeah. guys, this has been a, a great, I don't, I don't want to end it, but we've almost on three hours. <laughs> oh, oops. Are we really? So, oh, yeah. Sorry. So, okay, no, no, sorry. So we is, moved to Vegas and yeah. we moved to oh, here. Sorry. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh man. And now we're in Arizona. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah. well, no, this is going to, I think we need to do another one, another okay. episode uh, with Jerry. It'll be great. This is, I hope everyone who's listening has had a wonderful time listening to this. I know I've, I feel like I've been on an awesome, an awesome ride right now, getting to know you guys. And it was a beautiful conversation, yeah, beautiful conversation. So 
everyone who has uh, listened, we we pray that you pray for us continually for Coltish because uh, we are trying to make big steps and movements into making this show better for you guys. Also, you can go to the Coltishshow.com. You can donate there. If you like what you're hearing, you can support us, you know, one time monthly or annually. We do appreciate that. You can also go to apologiastudios.com. You can sign up for All Access, become an All Access member where you can get access to awesome content from Pastor Jeff Durbin, Pastor James White, so many different things you can see there, but you can also get access to Cultish The Aftermath. So again, thank you so much for listening to this episode of Cultish, and we'll see you next time as we enter into the kingdom of the cults.